Today is January 24th, 2024. It is 2.31 p.m. We're at 100 Polk Avenue here in Cape Canaveral, Florida for the City of Cape Canaveral special meeting. Call this meeting to order. City Clerk, or I'm sorry, Council Member Jackson, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum. Here. Mayor Morrison. Here. Councilmember Willis. Here. Thank you, and thank you again all for being here. This time, uh, if there's any changes or amendments to the agenda, uh, we can do that or approve it as written. We have one item here following uh, public participation. Uh, the one thing I would say is I would like the opportunity, certainly public participation to begin, but um, one, one agenda item for consideration uh, and given opportunity <clears throat> when this council mm -hmm. sees fit uh, to, to have a chance for the public to come back if needed and uh, provide more public comment. So um, that'll be I think on an as-needed basis. I don't think any action's necessarily needed on the agenda for that, but I felt like this was the best time to, to share that. And so with that, um, looking for a motion to approve as written or any changes? I'll make a motion made Second. We got a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Kellum, second by Council Member Willis to approve the agenda as written. Any further discussion? City Clerk. Council Member Davis. Four. Council Member Jackson. Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum. Four. Mayor Morrison. Four. Council Member Willis. Four. Thank you. Public participation portion of the meeting is now, and I do have one card from Ms. Peg Schaller, resident business owner, wants to speak on item number two. Peg, are you, you here? Would you like to speak now? And and if anyone else submitted a uh, public comment card, please just come forward and we can I would like to speak yeah, now, but I imagine um, I would also like to speak later. So I would be curious to see. So my name is Peg Schaller. I own and operate Ellie Mae's Tiki Bar. I um, entered into a lease at 116 Jackson Avenue on May the 1st of 2019. Uh, approximately two months later in July, I requested a Publix um, records request because I started noticing a lot of items with that building that were not to code. Primarily the plumbing that was installed at 116 at the time just ran directly and dumped into the backyard of Ellie Mays. So uh, in pulling the records request I found uh, two, a notice of violation and a second notice of violation on the revised notice of violation is dated 827 of 2018, in which 17 code violations were observed. There's also field notes provided with that, and the last field note states on January 9th of 2019. It was discussed to bring back to the code board, but since Shane has been correcting the violation, staying, uh, staff is giving more times in the hopes they'll become in compliance before it's taken back to the board. That's the last uh, staff note there is on this. However, from January 1 of 2019, until the time I pulled the first permit for Ellie Mays in July 6th 
of 2019. No um, permits were requested and no permits were pulled. So the items listed on this previous notice of violation had not yet been addressed. March of 2024, there was some debris, mainly a, a, a small individual sized tiki hut that caught fire in the back of 118 Jackson Avenue. In 118 Jackson Avenue, the fire department, in order to get to that fire, well, they wrongly thought it was um, our tiki bar that had caught fire, not realizing it was actually on the other side of the fence. So in 2024, I'm sorry, uh, March of 2024, we suffered our first loss, if you would, concerning this project. I had a conversation with Brian Palmer. February or March 9th of 2022 and was discussing the blight that was surrounding the property. At that time, I was told that they would come out to do an investigation and the entire property would be reviewed and they would uh, enforce anything that was in a code violation. However, on March 28, 2022, approximately two weeks after my complaint, I was the only one that received a violation at that property. Ms. Schaller, do you need some more time? I do, sir. Roughly how much, if you don't mind, and I can I work with I think I can wrap this up in five more minutes. Council, are we okay with an extension of five minutes? Please proceed, thank you. Thank you. So at that time, the other visible violations not even having to go on anybody's property were a boarded up window, were dilapidated stairs, and a, 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 an awning over the upstairs that was made out of uh, tiki or thatch that was, was crumbling, but those items were not um, recorded, they were not noted. In fact, they said there was no additional violations at the property at that time, only, only mine. The violation was for parking, and for the improper number of water closets. If not for the council's um, recent decision, we would be out of business. I'd like to make note when I said that it, we had pulled permits starting in July of 2019, I pulled paid for finalized permits for sign, electrical fence, commercial alterations, commercial plumbing, building, windows, doors, paving, driveway, and commercial mechanical renovations. I have invested no less than $400,000 to take a property which was by all means covered in blight and has made my best to do an impact. However, after reviewing and after having a conversation, I was the only one that received a violation. Comes back now that we've had another fire so the second fire took place August 5th of 2022. In August of 2022, Dave Dickey met with me. I said, Dave, I'm mad, mad as a wet hen. And he came over and I was just pacing. I said, look, I don't understand this. I don't understand the, the, the reason that I had a fire is that the debris that has continued to be around this property is what caught fire. And nothing's been addressed, nothing's been changed. And while I'm here, I would also like to know the neighbor has just paved over a complete surface that was uh, dirt, and but there was no violation for them where it took me four times to have John Picard come out and make sure I had the swales right and everything right. So I was asking, hey, how come there's no violation here? He says, I'll get back. December 5th, I send an email. I say, hey, where are we at with this? The fire happened in August and the front door to the upstairs stands wide open. The stairs still stand wide open. The garage is still full of debris and I'm not in the market to have a third fire. 
the answer, and we have record of this, was like, we'll have code enforcement take a look at it, and they're going to address any issues. But code enforcement did not take a, if they did take a look at it, there was nothing addressed. However, I sent pictures in June, so now we're almost at a year later, and said, where are we at with this? In fact, Brian, uh, Chris Robinson sent an email that said the area has been cleaned. However, I took pictures 10 minutes after that email and the area had not been cleaned. In fact, nothing had been done. However, exactly four days later, I received yet another notice of violation for putting down gravel in an area that used to be dirt. So the entire time that this building is at the point where it should, it has been deemed unsafe, unlivable, there has not been a single notice of violation. The owner has not been requested not one time to take any action, and there has not been one date to say this is when this action should be done. It was not until I received, uh, and I'll try to be brief, was not until I was then named in a lawsuit because a lady by the name of Kimberly Sobis fell down the stairs, fell down the stairs, the same stairs where the railing hasn't been secured since 2017. She fell down those stairs and was named in the lawsuit because the owner of the building does not have any insurance. I then had to fight and say, hey, this is not on my premise. This is not anywhere near my premise. But when they came out to do the investigation, they found the condition of the building, and I was then canceled from insurance. I was deemed non-renewable. I have many more things to discuss, and maybe we can do that at the end. But in the meantime, I have lost money from two fires. I have lost money having to um, defend myself against a fraudulent claim. And as of January 1, I'm sorry, January 9 of 2024, the building still remains unsecured. It put myself at risk, which is the least of my concerns, but I am, I have a, an occupancy of 202 people, and for the last 17 months, I have tried to keep 202 people plus the 20 people that I am personally responsible for on my staff safe. And the only thing that I have received in return up until two days ago was two additional notices of violations. I have pictures showing the condition of the building. I have them in August. I have them in December. I have them in June. I have them in November. I have them in January. If anybody would like to see them, I can make them available. I also have the emails, the texts, the the amount of times that I have tried to protect my business and the safety of my people that come to me. Thank you, Ms. Schaller. <laughs> City Manager, are the folks online, I see a few live streaming, is that capability there? I don't have any hands raised, but I just want to make sure I prompt them. Yeah, it should be on online. For those of you who might be uh, w wanting to speak publicly uh, online, uh, we ask that you please raise your hand uh, digitally. I will recognize and unmute you. Um, I don't see any raised at this time. And with that, we'll go ahead and close public participation. We're at 2.45 p.m. Uh, tonight's special meeting really has you know, one agenda item for consideration which is to review of community development departments, roles, responsibilities, and discuss actions proposed to resolve current issues for properties located on Fillmore Avenue and Jackson Avenue. So one agenda item uh, really uh, focused on uh, one area of our city and the services we provide and uh, with, with two properties uh, that, that outline uh, some of the challenges that we're facing today. And so uh, my hope is that we can discuss this as a council. Um, it, 
this meeting was requested Friday, and I know that some of you may have not had time to, to read through it, but I think we've been on the receiving end of some of these emails and correspondence from the city. Um, I tried to outline at a high level, uh, starting with Fillmore Avenue, uh, some of the correspondence to help really provide some sort of substance to, to what we're working with. And uh, in that effort, um, I put together uh, some action items for us to consider. Really, uh, one set of action items, six of them for Fillmore Avenue and an additional six for Jackson Avenue. Uh, the, the first property, Fillmore Avenue, um, I'll just read here on page six of seven. Uh, it really is regarding, <coughs> it was brought to my attention by the Hearst family who, who told their story um, in an email to the, to me and I believe some of the council. And this correspondence has been going on for some time um, between city administration, myself, and I have not had a chance to talk directly with the city council. Um, and so my request is that the city manager and administration to provide input on the proposed actions below and, then the, and that the city council consider providing the city some direction and necessary resources needed to expedite resolving the issues for the Hearst family and any other properties who have been impacted from this development on Fillmore Avenue. To highlight those, uh, number one is to obtain and uh, I think it's one page uh, just prior to that. Thank you very much, Daniel. Number one is to obtain and distribute a current building inspection report showing compliance and any existing violations with all applicable codes to the city council for all property owners at 304, 306, 314, and 316 Fillmore Avenue. Number two is to obtain an engineering field inspection report and review of all existing plans, letters, and calculations submitted by Allen Engineering and former city engineer John Picard to identify any concerns such as, but not limited to, a stormwater analysis on the existing drain uh, and pipe today compared to the expanded larger drain originally approved in the driveway of 306 Fillmore Avenue. Number three is to obtain plans and confirmations on a date for FPL to remove overhead lines and reinstall the line underground consistent with our city code. Number four is to obtain plans and confirmation on a date for the licensed contractor to complete the improvements recommended by the engineering firm and building inspection report from any of the items above, such as, but not limited to the swale in the backyard and number five is that the city manager and city attorney present any findings and or of opportunities in a report to be distributed to the city council on ways the city can improve our community development department. And last and certainly not least is to hear from the council any other actions and get feedback on these actions. The city council and city administration seems appropriate. In, if we could jump to the next set, I'll go through those and then we can, I think, begin the conversation. The second property, so the first one's related around um, really the building department permitting, and uh, I guess it crosses over into code enforcement. This one's largely uh, around code enforcement. Both of those services are within community development. And Jackson Avenue, as we heard from Ms. Schaller, one of the properties uh, impacted there. Uh, Number one, to provide a report generated from BSNA. For those of you who may not know and listening online, that is the software the city procured, I believe, five years ago. Um, I, I think we've spent over $300,000 on this software over the past five years. It's provided some wonderful uh, benefits for us. And when, you, when we 
say BSNA. We're really talking about the portal that our city staff utilizes to, to stay on top of projects. And also it has a public facing view um, that can provide information that's valuable not only to the council, but to the citizens, contractors, and, uh, and anyone else who is interested in learning more about a property. So uh, providing a report generated from BSNA that shows all actions and correspondence related to code enforcement and the property owners and tenants listed above on Jackson Avenue. Uh, create and distribute administrative procedures reviewed and approved by our city attorney complying with Florida state law and city code to be followed by our city code enforcement officers provide a list of certifications and continuing education completed and ongoing for the city code enforcement officers to obtain regarding code enforcement and BSNA. Number four, distribute a monthly BSNA report of all open code enforcement cases from initiation to closed, include other important data provided by BSNA such as data create uh, the date uh, the case was created, status, next step, and or any other information necessary to monitor. And number five is to review and distribute a comprehensive report from BSNA regarding the city's engagement with the properties located at 114, 116, 118, and 120 Jackson Avenue for the past five years and any findings and or opportunities to be distributed to the city council in ways the city can improve our community development department as it relates to code enforcement. And last and same in the, uh, the last is, I'm sorry, six is different. Request a training video to be available from BSNA that could be utilized by the city council and public on how to use BSNA. And what I was gonna say is last is obviously, the point is these are proposed um, action items. Um, so anything that, that this council or city administration believes we are have accomplished or is not needed, that's why this meeting is called. And so through, through the efforts to uh, understand these issues as they've been brought over the past few years, uh, I have worked with our city staff. Some of the things that um, these action items have began, uh, some of them might even be near finished, but we are not there. And when we go back to the, the visioning uh, early days, 2009, Cape Canaveral, we did a SWOT analysis, sw uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And uh, one of the big uh, ones on there is threats. And uh, as I recall and remember um, from the documents looking back, and still to this day, code enforcement and blight and issues in the city was considered a threat up there with hurricanes and other natu natural disasters. And, and I'm a, a, a big advocate on private property rights. We're not talking about someone painting their house a color or, or that we don't like. We're talking about serious life safety issues and or issues that we hope should be resolved. And so starting with Fillmore Avenue, sort of the front end, um, of a story of new homeowners uh, investing in Cape Canaveral, wanting to call Cape Canaveral home. Um, and their experience has served sort of a, as a case study. And I think that the meeting today is the next best step so that we can work together to fix them. And I, I, I am confident that we can fix them. Um, and I believe these issues or these action items are a path to help. Some of them had they uh, been implemented earlier, uh, I don't think we would have uh, invested as much time as we have and most importantly been able to resolve the issues. And ultimately that's the big goal is number one, resolve the, the tangible issues that these property owners are experiencing today. And number two is that we provide a structure and a framework with full alignment from this council and the community on how we're gonna move forward with, with uh, the building department and code enforcement within the city of Cape Canaveral. Um, as I said in the last meeting, our council has a lot of talent and skills and passions 
and these issues happen in every city, but we are striving to be the best we can be, and these have reached a point that I do think uh, requires all hands on deck. And so with that, I will pause, um, and I'd like to, to talk with the council and city staff on any questions uh, within the issues that, that we've outlined here today, and the hope is that we can you know, get back to work and move, move in a direction that we think will help. Council, I know you have your own versions and uh, of different stories and different properties. This is sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are other properties through the years where business owners have left Cape Canaveral. Um, and I do think that while it may not be directly related to their experience with the city, it had a large impact and we certainly didn't help their experience. And that's uh, a challenge we face today, um, that these two stories are sort of the, the quintessential uh, stories of what we want. Uh, a flagship property was, was Dottie's Bar, the Jackson Avenue pro property. And through exercises and envisioning, that was identified as one that the community really would like to see as an example improved. Um, property uh, owner, I believe has been the same owner for for at least 10 years, and uh, the tenants, uh, Peg and her husband, uh, invested in Cape Canaveral a significant amount of resources and really brought light and beauty to that property and has created something really special here. And, and that's what we want, small businesses moving in, trying to to transform properties to serve this community for things that we love and enjoy and, and really makes this place even more special than it is. And the Fillmore Avenue is uh, you know, a family who says, we're gonna call this home, we love it here, we wanna build a, a beautiful home, follow the code and enjoy Cape Canaveral and their experience ha has been a challenge uh, as well. And so with that, um, I'm trying to stay focused on the solutions, but if we need more support on why each one of these is maybe proposed or necessary, happy to go through them with the council, and I'll, I'll stop there in no particular order. If anyone would like to comment, city manager, anyone, uh, please just let me know. I'd like to comment. Um, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying, Mayor, and, and it's gotten to the point where I think these action plans are exactly what we need to see an end to these problems, and these aren't the only places in the city. And as a council, we're out amongst the people, and we, I, we, I'm all sure, all of you, uh, try to help our residents. And when I've contacted Peg many times, I've talked to the people on Fillmore, and when, when I say, well, I'll see what I can do, and then nothing happens, it reflects bad on the council and the city, and um, I think what we, what we need to do is get these things done. Um, you know, there's other things like, and we've heard from uh, the residents of Portside Villa, that's another ongoing problem that really affects the residents, and I think sometimes we need to prioritize what where we're going and what we're doing and I know sometimes I sound like a broken record when I say you know we're spending money on these new projects and this and that and this is why you know we need to move on as a city but we need to fix the problems that are here already before we move on with money or uh, new projects um, I know I personally have said to Dave and the, and the department, do we need to hire more people? Do we need another person? What do we need to do to address these things? And, you know, they, so far we haven't um, hired anybody for that department that I know of other than, you know, replacing code enforcement officers. But, you know, we, we claim to be a business friendly community. Are we really? I mean, when it comes down to it, I know we're looking at codes and ordinances that will help business, you know, we need to work with them um, and, and not for them to feel like 
they're talking and no one is listening. And when I'm out there amongst the people, I don't want them to think that I'm listening, but then I just go home and go, well, whatever. You know, I, I really think that we need to um, care about what the residents say, you know. I, there was a comment at a meeting that, you know, well, this board, this council really cares about the people and listens to them. Well, isn't that what we're here for? You know, I mean, we were elected by the people to listen to them and to help them. And then the people on Fillmore, months and months ago, probably a year ago, we were talking about this. We want families to come to our city. We don't want it to be a short-term rental city. We want families for school and the recreation center and all our amenities. So we need to do what we can to help them. And this, this has been a horrible thing for these people that it has gone on this long and not being able to enjoy being in Cape Canaveral and living in a new home. So I think that's really important. And, um, you know, we represent the people and, but we need to have the staff help us, help them. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Willis. Uh, I agree we need to look into this and we need to investigate it. We need to find solutions. Those, those are the main things, solve the problems. Um, when the Hearst emailed back on January 4th, I went out and looked at the site and listened to them and uh, like Council Member Callum, or Mayor Pro Tem Callum said, we're supposed to be helping the people. They are the ones that put us here. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And I told him I would do whatever I could. And I came back and met with Dave and uh, uh, City Manager Morley and just asked that whatever pressure we can put, let's, let's see what we can do. And also got a history lesson. And there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. There's a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different inputs and efforts that had to go into this. And I'm sure that the city manager and Dave can update us on what's been happening. We've all seen the emails. But three months, I said all that to say this, three months ago, I met with Dave's department and sat in on one of their um, scrum meetings on Monday morning. And they have an application called Trello that uh, they manage their projects with. It could easily be adapted to be a customer service application that works throughout city staff where a complaint or ticket comes in and it gets assigned and then you it moves down the list and it doesn't get removed it can be ticklers where you know you haven't done anything about this for two days somebody needs to look at it or it goes from department to department because a lot of these issues affect are coming across multiple departments so it could be something as simple as adding additional process or utilizing some of the uh, applications we already have in place, just extending that purpose. BSNA may even have a component of that where it could track the tickets so that nothing falls through the cracks and everyone is accountable. So that would be one way we could solve it. Um, and it may, may require to uh, upgrade but I think it's a small price to pay to uh, help our citizens, so. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Jackson. Um, I have some questions that are probably more process related, so they'll probably more be a, more applicable to tech for you, Dave. Um, okay, so how do we track our open enforcement tickets or complaints or violations and how are they audited as far as being open for a certain length of time? Yeah, I mean, we are definitely, the Community and Economic Development Department is definitely the city's complaint department. Um, we, we, that's, we, we deal with a lot of complaints. Um, and so that's a good, great question. Um, and we really, I would say the majority of the complaints come in uh, for purposes of code enforcement. Uh, I get very, I'm aware of very few complaints uh, regarding the CRA or the 
building department or um, planning and zoning, a lot of the other functions that we are responsible for. So I, I think what you're asking is, or, or really the applicability is with respect to code enforcement. How do, how do we, I th and it's how do we monitor that? How do we track that? And how do we stay on top of those, those complaints that we do receive? And those, um, when we receive a complaint, um, those complaints are funneled through Mr. Brian Palmer. Uh, Brian is our code enforcement manager. He's also the deputy director of the department. Um, so Brian's very well plugged into the department operations and is able to see across different functional responsibilities of the department um, in case somebody else needs to get involved with a, a particular complaint, whatever that may be. Um, I would. Uh, I would characterize most of the complaints that I'm aware of as um, minor. Um, I'm not speaking about the two specific issues that we're here talking about today. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to address a, um, in general, and I, I hope that's what your question was. Well, was, and was another regarding, so. aspect of that, if, if you don't mind me throwing this in there. No. Do you have a tiered category to be able to, to when we either get a complaint or con citizens concern a situation uh, like on Fillmore or anything like that? Or is there a tiered system in this software to be able to set a priority to things so that they can be handled quickly? Because what I'm seeing with this and also with Portside, or yeah, is it? Portside Villas. Yeah, Portside Villas. That these are, these are going on for a long time and there's gotta be a, a process that we use to follow up on these that are hanging out there open. Yeah, we do have a process, um, and I, I'll get back to your original question here shortly. Okay. Um, we do have a process. Uh, Brian Palmer uh, has, has prepared, a, I'll call it a spreadsheet. It's a flowchart. Um, it's a code enforcement flowchart, and I'm sure Brian could pr provide a copy. I know the mayor's seen a copy of this. I'm not sure about anybody else. Uh, but we do have a flowchart that, that spells out exactly the, the, the code enforcement process and the process that we take. Um, through to completion of, of the issue. Whether it re in general, what will happen is our code enforcement officer will, once it's been assigned to a particular officer, in this case, they're all he, so I can't, won't say he or she, he um, will go out and identify and investigate the, uh, the, the complaint to determine whether there is a violation or not. Oftentimes, we'll get complaints and there is no violation, um, or at least we don't see evidence of a violation. And so that, that item is what we call closed in the field. Um, and and the, our, our practice is to notify the individual that made the original complaint. Um, if there is a complaint or a violation that's identified, our, always our goal is to not escalate code enforcement issues and, and actions and matters. We try to deal with them on a um, uh, very personal basis, if you will. And so our officers will address, once an, once an issue is identified, they will work with that property owner or tenant or whatever the case is. And work for what we call voluntary compliance. Um, and depending on the circumstances, uh, an officer will work on a, in a, for a very short time or for potentially a, a lengthy time on, vi on um, voluntary compliance, just depending on the circumstances of the, of the situation. There may be an elderly property owner, there may be a property owner without, any, without sufficient funds to address the issue. There's just a lot of circumstances that go into, uh, go into a, um, I'll call it the a discretion of the prosecutorial discretion of a code enforcement officer. Um, so once a, um, once let's just, in assuming voluntary compliance cannot be reached, at that point, um, our city manager has instituted a practice that we will issue a, um, we'll call it a courtesy letter. So we will, it'll become a little bit more formalized and we will issue a courtesy letter to that property owner. Generally, we only work with property owners. Typically, we don't work with tenants um, because the, the property owner is ultimately responsible for the code violation. Um, so we'll send out a courtesy letter to the property owner um, informing them of what, what the issue is and what needs to be done to bring it into compliance. Again, depending, and I, I'm sorry, I can't give you hard and fast rules. There's so many things that go into a, um, um, 
each particular situation. But depending on the nature of the violation, um, will depend on how long the officer gives a property owner to address it through the courtesy letter, in the courtesy letter phase. Um, assuming that they don't address it voluntarily through the courtesy letter, we will take, we will be, we will issue a little more formal correspondence. It's called a notice of violation or an NOV. I'm sure you've heard of NOVs before. NOVs, are, again, are sent to the property owner. And NOVs, again, are a little bit more formal. They they give a specific amount of time to the property owner to address the issue. Um, specific sections of code are identified in the NOV, uh, listing the vi specific violations. And then um, remedies to the violation are also provided. You can do this to address this particular violation. Um, and should, I, I'm, this is all worst case scenarios here, this, I'm, so I'm kind of trying to follow the process. Should a property owner not comply with the NOV, at that point we will take the property owner to what we have uh, in replace of our old code enforcement board, our new special magistrate, code enforcement special magistrate. And our special magistrate essentially sits as a judge over code enforcement issues. And his hearings, if you've never been to a hearing, I would recommend that you do. Um, they're held, they're held quasi um, like a judge would hold a, a, a hearing. Um, he allows um, evidence and testimony and things like that. So, so we will, uh, we'll schedule a hearing if the NOV isn't uh, um, complied with. We'll schedule a hearing in front of our code enforcement special magistrate. And at that point, both parties are, we, we notice it's a fully noticed meeting. The public can come. Um, but the, primarily perp the primary purpose of that meeting is for the um, um, the city to present its facts, provide testimony, and then the, um, the property owner is allowed to do the same thing. And then the, the special magistrate will chew on all that, and within a week or so, he will issue what we call an order, special magistrate order. And the order is basically his ruling. He will spell out specific things that need to occur in specific time frames. And... Um, Moving forward, if the property owner does not comply with those requirements in the order, um, we will hold another hearing called a Massey hearing. It's basically a compliant, it's, it's a hearing to reintroduce the issue and provide updates to the special magistrate. Um, the special magistrate will then find um, whatever he finds. And um, he can, at that point, he can assign um, fines and liens against the property. So that is the process, and there's very strict time frames and timelines that have to be met through that process, and that's what that, that flow chart, I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of the flow chart. Um, that, that's very, I, th I think it's all spelled out in that flow chart as well, but that's, that's kind of a, a 10,000 foot um, um, overview of the city's code enforcement process. Now, as far as, back to your original question of priorities, how do we prioritize things? Generally, Items, life, health, safety issues are prioritized. They're, they're number one priority, of course. And those are typically things, we have raw sewage coming out of a house. Um, you know, there's various things that fall into that category. Um, and so we'll, um, we'll. Uh, so how do you audit anything pending that's out there for a couple of years? Because we literally, since I've gotten on Candle, we have things that have been pending for a couple of years. Yeah, a lot of cases, surprisingly, um, there are items out there that have been two or three or f we have We have cases on the books that are five years old. But generally what happens is those properties have fines running on them. Once, once, a, once a piece of property has a, has a levied fine on it, there's very little enforcement we as a city can do at that point. Um, we can, in extraordinary cases, we have foreclosed on a code enforcement lien. We did that at 305 SURF. If you re I, I don't know if you were aware of that. Some of the council may have been here on the, on the council at that time. This was about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. We foreclosed on a, um, on a uh, code enforcement fine uh, because the house was just in horrendous conditions. We had to actually go to the um, circuit court, I believe, and get a... Uh, 
a authorization from a judge to enter into the property and, and deal with it. So it, it's it's a significant item. Uh, we're actually we're also closing on a, force, a code enforcement lien right down here in Polk currently. Um, so although we have these items that are been out there in the, on the on the books for many many years, once the city establishes its fines and liens, there's very there's there's our our, our we're limited in what we can do. In particular, if it's a homesteaded property, we can't even, the, the foreclosure process is even taken away from us. Right, now I know so. that on a homesteaded property, and I've actually represented a client in another city that had liens on three buildings for multiple years, and usually you can really get their attention when they start getting letters for $35,000, $40,000, dollars from these liens, mm -hmm. and when you put a date for foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was wondering why these would go that long, because the cities that I've dealt with, they don't let them go that long. But I can understand if it's the nature of the violation or if it's homesteaded. Yeah, um, and, and there ha excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I just want to make one more point on that is that Again, it, it really varies property by property. Oftentimes, there's more senior, what are called senior liens against a property than a city code enforcement lien. Property taxes, for example, those are more senior than city code enforcement liens. So there, there are some situations where it doesn't make any sense to foreclose the city because we wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't really um, um, accomplish what we're trying to do. But uh, um, Anyways, yeah. Okay, then the other question I had, um, on, the, on the properties, let's say we get a, a concerned citizen, they call in, uh, similar to Peg and her, um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, on that property, the stairwell she's speaking of is part of that building. Mm -hmm. um, not her section of the building, but part of the building. So when, when we send someone out for an, a property inspection, how, how would we possibly miss that a stairwell had a loose railing or anything of that nature is what I'm curious. Maybe it wasn't at the time, maybe a storm came through. I don't know the circumstance for that, but what type of process do we use when we inspect these properties? That's a great question. And I'm I'd just, ask Brian to come up who has a lot more knowledge of that the response. <laughs> I just wanna make sure I understand. Sure. junk out of the way. Generally, inspections are done when, when, we, when someone files a complaint, the first thing we do is we go out to the property and we look at the complaint that was filed. If somebody files a complaint for trash and debris, we look for trash and debris to see if there's anything. The second thing we do is we look for any other violations on the property. Anything that may step, you know, jump out at us, anything that, may, that we may see. Um, just basically walk around the property. The, only, the other thing that we have to remember is that we have a certain limitation of where we can go on a property without the uh, property owner's permission. <clears throat> we can't just arbitrarily, you know, walk around the whole property. We can technically, we are allowed to go, if you kind of look at it this way, we're allowed to go where a pizza delivery guy can go unless we are allowed by the property owner. So if we walk onto a property, somebody files a complaint, let's say uh, trash and debris, that's the easiest one. Somebody files a complaint about trash and debris, and we show up to the property, and we don't see anything. And we say, well, we, we don't see any trash and debris. And then the, the complainant goes, well, it's out back. Well, we can't walk out back, because that's private property. So we can't go out there. Now let's say that there's a, um, uh, let's say there's common area on the side of the property. So I walk down the side of the property because I can be in common area, that's legal. I walk down the side of the property and there's a six foot tall fence. Now everybody just watched me walk up here and realizes that I'm over six foot, I'm six foot five. So I could see over that fence. But another code officer who isn't over six foot tall cannot see over that fence. And he can't use any, um, what we call uh, artificial means to look over that fence. He can't hold a camera up over the fence and take a picture. 
So those are some of the roadblocks that we come across. You asked specifically about the railing that was along <coughs> the stairwell. Um, that The railing did not appear to be dilapidated. Um, there is railings that um, aren't on the ceiling, on the roof. When you climb up the stairs, there's no railings up there. It used to have rope back in the day that outlined it. It doesn't now. The magistrate did bring up that and did inform him that he needs to have a railing around that. Um, there, were, there were a lot of issues that, that, we had, that we had saw on that property, um, along with a lot of issues on our other properties. Each code enforcement officer right now has about 40 cases that he's working. I'm down to one code officer right now. The new one, I, he's been here for a month, so I can't really use him in, in, the, in, the, um, in the premise that I can the older code officer. Um, so I'm kind of down to one code officer right now. Um, the other code officer that just left, he left me with 40 cases. Actually, I think it was 42, but who's counting? 40 cases. Um, I've closed probably about 10 of them. I'm still working the others. Time frames, you, you, Miss, uh, Mr. Dickey spoke on time frames. We do have a process. Um, code enforcement is governed by Florida Statute 162. That tells us how we are to do our job. That, tell, that gives the, the city and municipalities the ability to have a code enforcement, and it tells them how they're going to utilize their code enforcement. Can we, I? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, interrupt fine. you, Brian. Um, so hearing that tells me we definitely have a manpower issue, number one. Um, number two, with the software that we use, one that Don mentioned, as well as BSNA, um, is there any ability to use that for notifying when something's gone past a certain date so that it pops up to you? Because obviously, with that type of workload, you're going to have a hard time keeping up with what's out there and Absolutely. what could be old. Absolutely. And, it's, and, a, and a computer program is only as good as the person using it. Right. And, and, that's, and, uh, and it does have, I don't mean to interrupt you, but okay. I want to answer your question before I forget it, before we get into something else. Yes, it does. When, when a code officer goes in and he um, creates a case, he fills out all the, um, everything in the system. If he fills it out completely, it works perfect. He puts in there an inspection or a reinspection, or a hey, check on this, or whatever, and it, it puts in a date. And that, at, when that date comes up, it'll send him an email and say, hey, you're doing reinspection on this date, because it assigns an inspection to him. And in the past, we've utilized that. The, a lot of cases do get spread out. They do get like, like Mr. Diggy said, there are a lot of cases on the books that do go further than what we even wish them to go. A lot of times it's, it, it's it, you, you get into property owners who want to, who you believe as a code officer, because they, always, they tell you in training the number one objective of a code officer is compliance. It's not to lean a property. It's not to take someone's personal property. It's not to find people. It's compliance. If we can get compliance in the field, that's our best thing. So a lot of times you get property owners who want, who you believe want to do the right thing, and you work with them, 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 and then a year later you go, you got me, because you, you're, you're just, you're, you're playing on my, you know, niceness of a code officer. That's not all the cases. I'm just saying that that could be, that is some of them. But yes, to answer your question, yes, we do have a, the BSNA system does alert you to certain things as long as you implement those things. And, and I'll also mention Trello, the, the software program that um, Council Member Willis discussed. Yes, it does have those capabilities. It has tracking, it has notification. Um, abilities and capabilities. So, yeah, we've we've we used I'll call it the uh, bare bones free version of it. It's still very helpful, um, but there are uh, upgrades that you can acquire. 
uh, cost money. Um, but there are, there are upgrades to really beef up some of those processes that, that, I, meant, that, that I mentioned, yeah. Okay, and then I have an, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on a yeah, roll of questions That's here. Right. So, so here um, this is more something I ran, I've run into in the private sector. Since we're down people and we have one code enforcement officer and that is amazing because the workload do we have the ability to hire contractors temporarily until the positions are filled if we have them open? And are there any open positions? No, I actually have a position filled now. We hired him a month ago. He started a month ago. It takes a little bit longer than that to really get into the swing of things. He's still reading the code. I mean, our code book is, as you've probably seen it, is like this big. Um, I don't ask him to memorize it. I just ask him to know, to, to know, you know, pretty much where to find everything. Um, he is active out there. It's just, it, it's difficult because he doesn't know what he can and can't do as far as legalities come. Uh, we are bound by laws and bound by ways we have to do things. Um, there are certain time frames we have to take in, we have to take in consideration due process, um, different things to that effect. And um, he's currently working hand in hand with the other code officer. Um, he's coming along. I, I'm I'm hoping in the next you know in the next month or so he's going to be out there in full bore. Well, that's good news that we have someone in that position and and working on that. Now, I have another question, <laughs> y'all. I'm sorry. No, um, don't. Don't. As we discussed the no, you know, going over the fence with a camera, mm -hmm. if you're short, um, <clears throat> is there any statute or any situation that would prevent us from using a high level, not meaning hovering at the window, drone picture? Okay. Because you can see drone pictures um, from far away and people are constantly, realtors use them all the time, all this. So, but I wasn't sure, is there a statute against that? It's not, it, it's a, um, it, it's private property laws that actually jump into that. Code enforcement has looked into that on numerous occasions and they've been advised by their legal um, authorities that that is not legal or, or authorized to do that because it says you can't use any artificial means to see the violation and that would be an artificial, uh, artificial mean to, use, to actually see the violation. Councilmember so, Jackson, if I could add, um, however, publicly available information can be used, such as the Brevard County Property Appraiser. They have, they fly, I think, two or three times a year and get aerial photographs and it's available to the public and we use that frequently. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Um, and yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. Now we do use, any photos provide to us from a complainant, right? Yes, now there are other ways, and as you know, you're, as a code officer goes through his training and stuff, he gets that, he gets that information on other ways to, to basically see violations. Um, single family residences, we always go to the neighbors and we ask them, hey, I see you have a second floor, do you mind if I go up there and look over into your neighbor's yard? Some people do, some people don't wanna get involved stuff to that effect. People who have complainants, who, who have uh, videos, who have pictures, who have stuff like that, yes, we can use that to a certain extent. They still have to come to the magistrate hearing though to, to, to verify what the magistrate's looking at. If we can't verify what they're looking at or we can't verify how that picture was taken, then the magistrate's gonna kick it out. He's not gonna allow us to present that evidence. So if we have that individual there, he can question them and ask them, you know, where were you when you took the picture? How did you take this picture? Where was this? Da -da, all these questions. And then he can, then he'll make that decision whether it's admissible or not. With the Portside property, we've been very successful on those. Those folks are really engaged. And they've, I've received three different emails uh, with photos um, of, of alleged violations. So that, it, it, that can play a real big part. Okay, that's good to know. I had one other, let's see if I missed it. 
Okay, maybe that one I, come back. I'd like, to, I'd like to respond to one of your previous questions about whether there's services or agencies that provide code enforcement service, uh, services. I'm not aware of one. Um, there, I, I am aware of companies who go out, they're called private providers, who provide um, building department services. And we've actually contracted with one. So we, we have one in reserve and it should one of should our, our needs require some additional help. So we've got some folks kind of on the bench ready to go with the building functions of the city. With code enforcement, if, if there is one out there, I'd love to know about it, but I'm not aware of it. Well, that's good to know that we do have some resources to tap on the building side, which will free up some of time if, if needed, you know, to get this resolved if that was decided. Um, and then the other thing, this is a real general question, Brian. You're going to love this one. <laughs> and what is your estimation on the amount of code that we have in this city that is old, archaic, and no longer applicable? <laughs> that you are legally bound as a as a code enforcement officer to ensure that that code is looked at as well because for example a state I know still has on their books you spit on the sidewalk you can get arrested and that was from the 1800s so do we have an a huge insane amount of old code that's really not applicable during these time frames anymore? Huge insane? I would say no. Okay. I would say we don't have a huge insane amount. We do have some code and we're working on it as a department that, that need to probably be updated, that probably need a little more where they can be enforced. But our department and the city attorney have been working <sighs> with those. Bless you. Have been working with that, um, you know, working together to try to update that those types of codes i mean i think we brought through a whole bunch lately well i, I think every time the council looks at a uh, administrative rezoning uh tranche those are all because of outdated or 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 um, codes that have been superseded um, if the council remembers a few years ago when we had to address all of those uh, non-conforming condos around the city because of the density issues really kind of related to the same semi-related those are all outdated codes that have been superseded. So, uh, uh, but setting those aside, we, we do have a number of zoning land use related codes that really need to be updated. We, we spend a lot of our time dealing with that. If um, I could interject here also, and I, I see we have our planning and zoning board, um, Lamar Russell is here, uh, who I'll love and respect. He has this, one of my famous sayings, he's got several sayings, but one of my favorite one of his sayings is this, you always get one of what you don't want before you address it. And that's how we learn what areas of our code need to be fixed because something it gets exposed. You say, wow, there's a weakness right there. We need to shore that up. And frequently that's how code revisions come to city council. Yeah, such as the, the, the elimination of parking. I mean, the city's evolving and changing, and our codes do too. And frankly, they really haven't done much in the last 40 years, since the 80s, early 80s. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of gray area in our code. I, and I hate to bring this one up, but I'm going to. It's the, De, the whole De Christopher matter. There was a lot, as you recall, as the council recalls, there was a lot of disagreement on how to interpret the codes that related to the De Christopher matter. And in my mind, it's because there is some gray in there. And so there's, as, as we come across those things, we do need to make note and make some changes. There's still a lot of it in the code. Yeah, we found one this morning uh, about um, floodplain administration and permits, which seemed to imply that you didn't use this code if there was a single family home on it, but it meant if there was no single family home on it. Yeah. It's just the way it was written. It, it wasn't meant to be read that way, but now you read it this way, and so oh, we need to fix that. Thank you. Councilmember Jackson, are you? Yes. Finished for now? For now. Councilmember Davis? No, I'm waiting. Okay. Councilmember Willis? I have one quick question for Dave. How do you, how do you differentiate on a notice of violation between the renter occupant and the property owner? Because it seems some of these notice of violations that went to Ms. Schaller should have gone to the 
property owner. Can I, can I answer that? Sure. Mm -hmm. the, the, the notice of violation actually does go to the property owner. We courtesy copy the tenant. So we send a courtesy copy to the tenant to make sure that they're aware of the violation that's on the property. But the notice of violation does go to the property owner. And the reason why we send the notice of violation to the property owner, not because it's, you know, it's also in the Florida statute that tells us how to do that. However, we send the notice to the property owner because the property owner is ultimately responsible. If, we, if the magistrate decides to place a lien on the property, the tenant's not affected, but the property owner is. So that's why we always send the notice to the property owner. Okay, so as a follow-up to that, so if Ms. Schaller had invited you into the back to inspect the staircase that would be visible from the back of her property or the back of her establishment, would you have then sent a notice of violation to the property owner for that? The property owner did get the notice of oh, okay. oh, what you mean for the stairs themselves? Stairs and there, I believe it's a little garage door that burned down. I think I, I saw it at one of your concerts. And, yes, uh, you know. yes, the, yes. The notice of violation would have gone to the property owner. The property owner did get a notice of violation that included that. Yeah, but there the, was the question is, would if if Peg would have invited a code, code enforcement board or excuse me code enforcement officer into the backyard would they have would that have given them the authority to do that yes yes as a, a tenant can invite you in and allow you access to the property yes okay all right thank the you only legal thing that may that we would have to kind of discuss with the magistrate is the different sections of that property because it's a commercial property and there are different um, tenants and, and, and things, but that would we would discuss that prior to. Well, I know I know that I have seen the things that Ms. Mm -hmm. Schaller's questioned and just in attending events at her establishment, so it's visible to me. I would think it would be visible to anybody if she invites you in, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just want to I've got notes kind of of some of the things that went through, and I think you were largely answering the questions of Council Member Jackson and, and Willis. The issue of access, the first one, which is what I think we were just talking about. I'm not aware of having an access issue for Fillmore Avenue or Jackson Avenue. That's a legitimate challenge you explained as far as you're limited by state law, mm -hmm. accessing property, talked about some extreme measures of liens and sir. But did you experience any issues with accessing either one of those properties? I didn't. Co uh, code enforcement Phil isn't involved with the Fillmore yeah. property. Phil it's, Fillmore sure. never got then to Then Jackson point. Avenue? Yes, did Jackson Avenue never had an issue with um, with entry into there. They did place a, uh, or he, the property owner did try to place barriers in front of us to keep us from going back there. Um, we discussed numerous things with him about the barriers, asked him to remove them, stuff to that effect. Um, but other than that, I, I, not that I know of, I, I'm not sure. I would, I would have to speak with the code officer that was out there, but I, I, not that I know of. I, I, think, I think the record's clear that Peg was very forthcoming and open in allowing access onto at least at a minimum her piece of the property. Yeah, so if my hope is that if we're focused on the solutions that we match them up with actual problems that happen in these particular cases. And so access might be an issue. I don't think it was an issue for, for either one of the properties from the emails that I see. No. The, the other issue or, or you know, uh, so th that, coincides with the height of the fence and the things like that. Those weren't, I think, standing in our way. Um, manpower. Uh, this has been going on for two years, as Mayor Pro Tem said, and I think going back further, um, we've, we've asked about do we need more resources, and we've been given uh, an answer of no, we're okay uh, today. And so... While today we might be down to one code enforcement officer um, with one in training, I'll say, uh, I don't think we had a, a manpower issue at those times. But if I'm wrong, I think that would be good to know. 
No, I was asked about today. So I, I was responding for today. We have one code yes. officer. Um, back at, at when this all started with the, with the violations, no, I had two code officers. One of them wasn't, wasn't certified in training level one. However, he was still a code officer, yes. Thank you. And the, um, the software, the third thing that we've talked about is the capabilities of the software. From my understanding of, of BSNA, we don't have a, a, a major function issue. And we had a chance to sit down. We had a challenge that I think a lot of organizations have of, you know, as you said, Officer Palmer, if we put all the information in, it works perfectly. So that tells me our software works perfectly. Maybe there certainly there's improvements and better, flashier, shinier objects out there. But we invested in this. It is better than what we had. And the ability to customize and add fields and those things are there if needed. And so I think we're, we're on the BSNA boat. Um, it's a good software. We have manpower. We have access. Procedure, the fourth one, state law, city code when applied on from the building department of Phil, Fillmore Avenue to the code enforcement issues on Jackson and changing the ordinances, I don't think we have, in some of the examples we shared about ordinance issues with floodplains and, and uh, you know, the administrative rezoning, we didn't have a code enforcement issue here, right, that was standing in our way to, to no. administrate. So those are, those are um, important points that, that I want to make because I think if we can talk about the challenges as it relates to starting with Fillmore Avenue that we experience. And work on some solutions. Um, I believe I've connected my understanding and, and thick files that's accrued over the years, some good first steps that will help uh, resolve these issues today. And so, um, but I don't want to, to overlook and give city staff, you answer the questions presented. I guess I will ask the same question as it relates to these properties, starting with Fillmore. What are the things that, if we go back through again, that we need to do, I guess, to improve? And most, actually, if we could just talk about resolving the issue today, I think FPL is a, an important part of yeah. this puzzle, and then we can and go backwards. But the, the, the issues um, around the power line, distribution line being underground, and the uh, fourth or fifth attempt for the contractor to uh, install a swale and dig a swale that, that aligns with the plans. I think those are two open pending ones. And uh, yep. yeah, if I could address that, Mayor, thank Please. you. And the mayor has been working with me on this for many months, I think about a year since you, you and I started first met out there. Um, most of you know the story. We're happy to answer any details. <clears throat> um, and I, I have to say, we appreciate the patience of the residents. They're definitely going through an, an issue here. Um, but I, I want to assure that I, I think there's there's no personalities, there's no bad guys. Everybody wants to do the right thing. It's a matter of making it happen. And I can summarize what I've learned from this and the, the two things that were implemented as a result of this particular project. One is we tightened up our um, plan revision application process. Um, I wasn't happy once I learned the details about how informally revisions had been approved um, with very little additional 
um, involvement from other departments. Things were just kind of unilaterally approved that should have been in front of the whole development review committee, in my opinion. So um, as a result of um, a meeting we had earlier, the first of this year uh, with the development review committee meeting, a procedure was put in place for a formal application and review procedure steps. Um, and that application that, that application is now on BSNA, right? You, and that's where you get the application. And the application kind of describes how a, rev a request for revision will get routed. Um, and staff has been trained on it. There's an internal procedural document that's available if council wants to see it. So that's one thing that has gotten very much tightened up as a result of this. And I'm very glad to say that. The second thing is um, that there was an informality to approvals that um, we addressed internally. Um, so no more do we allow verbal approvals from um, any official, any inspector, any outside party, city engineer in particular. Of course, we have a new city engineer and I, they don't do anything without documenting it. But we used to have a different city engineer um, and things were done verbally that make it very difficult to put a timeline together about when things were approved or even if they were approved or denied. So that is the second thing that we put in place in, again, the whole community development department knows this, that we no longer accept any verbal approvals or um, denials or anything. It's all documented and loaded into BSNA. So those two things are, are, are gonna help us never have to deal with what happened on the Fillmore townhomes again. Mayor, I'd like to add one thing to that, mm -hmm. and I agree completely with what Todd is saying, but the, th the third thing that really was brought to the fore with me was the city's relationship and interactions with Florida Power and Light. Um, I, I learned some new things, frankly. I've been doing this for almost 35 years, and I really didn't understand the autonomy uh, that utilities have in operating in in cities and in counties, um, and so I was. Um, um, I think with that knowledge, I think with with I think we all have it now. Mike and and, and myself, Mike Mike German, the building official. Um, I think after a review of the franchise agreement, um, that it's it's a, uh, and, and it, it's a. Frankly, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the FPNL does have the autonomy that they do have. I understand it. It's, it's as a critical infrastructure element, so I understand why they have that. But, but they do act independent of the city with respect to providing um, service to, to homes, in particular when they're working in their easements or utility easements. But, um, and Mayor, I don't know if um, if there are um, the unit owners from Fillmore here or not. If they have the latest information, Mayor, you got this email, which I forwarded to the council from uh, FPL External Affairs Manager Michelle Mural. She um, got this additional information from the FPL engineer on the project uh, yesterday, and that engineer said that um, he reached out to the customer who owns the fence, and they gave permission for the FPL to do the job, even if it damages the fence. And that was a reason that they didn't do the job before last time. He adds that he spoke to the underground contractors, and they are meeting tomorrow, which is today, at 2.15, so they've already met, to discuss this job and avoid any issues. If all goes well, he says, we are hoping by January 29th for the job to be done. Please note this is the underground job with underground contractors. The overhead removal job will need to be released after the underground job is done. So one of your item on, items on there is to um, request a time frame um, from FPL. And right now they're saying they're hoping for January 29th for the overhead or for the underground work to be done. Then once that's done, they will be able to do uh, schedule the removal of the pole and the overhead lines. And I believe there's another utility, is it Bright House? Or yeah, Spectrum? it's uh, the cable provider. I so believe it's that I think it might or, be Spectrum. They're uh, taking care of that too, or they're... They've been notified of that they need to coordinate with them. The, that's gonna that have pole. to get done yeah. along with this. Yeah. And then of course the, the, the builder can do his thing after that. And to that point, um, the builder contacted me um, about a week ago wanting to meet with me and I said I'd be very interested in meeting with you 
you know, there's, there's always three sides to a story. Um, and I invited him to come to this meeting today and he, he declined, did not want to be here. But he did submit um, a letter, and I, and I can read it for the record if it helps Mayor, what he wrote. He says, and he wrote this to Dave, there it is on the screen, uh, dated yesterday, I'd like to assure you and the city that CAPE 3 LLC's position has always been and remains that we com will commit our resources to resolve the drainage soil issue behind 304 and 306 Fillmore Avenue. Our necessary work, however, is dependent on FPL first completing their intended underground supply line work. For the record, CAPE 3 at no time provided FPL any instruction on how to bring power. FPL solely determined how their work would be performed to accommodate the submitted building plans. Because FPL's work will be confined to just the west side, 304, 306, of the two duplex parcel, we've already adjusted the swale on the east side of 314 and 316. In July of 2023, with the intent of showing good faith and not having to wait on FPL, Cape 3 used its resources to hire a contractor to meticulously adjust the drainage swale on the east side. It was three months earlier that Allen Engineering had provided elevation stakes for the needed adjustment, and that layout was followed exactly. After the adjustment, the site was completed, sodded, and detailed. It's worth mentioning, Dave, that all four purchasers of the homes built for Cape 3 were given a 10-day inspection period and the right to cancel. Not only did no one cancel, but not a single purchaser expressed a concern with the drainage soil. It was not until December 12th of 2022 that Ron Abeles and I were surprisingly yet correctly informed by the city that we had a problem. What the Hearst 306 and Anderson 304 have had to deal with for now over a year is regrettable, terribly unfortunate, and I'm sure very irritating. The mischaracterization and innuendo of Cape 3's intent and of me personally is also unfortunate. Jan, Ron, and I look forward to correcting any misassumptions taken by any resident or any city official. Please keep me advised of FPL's progress. So um, Dave, please make sure he gets that latest correspondence from Michelle Mural from FPL. Um, he says, thank you, Gary. So uh, we're, we're grateful that despite the problems that we had on this, We've got a developer that wants to see this fixed, evidently, and he's, he's willing to um, exert resources to complete this. And he, he is saying he's dependent on FPL getting their thing done, and I think that's, that's accurate. So Dave's point about FPL is frustrating for all of us, uh, although now that it's gone to the top of the chain with Ms. Mural, um, yeah. it looks like things are actually going to be happening seriously yeah. now on this uh, January 29th date. Yeah, it's just Mayor, regrettable that it took it. Has Mayor, taken I'd, I'd like to also introduce into the record to my personal frustrations with working working with FPL. I have 14 pages of emails that I personally sent to the FPL FPNL about this issue, about asking and cajoling and what's the status and when is this going to happen. 14 pages of emails I personally sent. That's just to FPNL. And so it's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm not sure what we can do as a city to address our, our uh, level of involvement with them, um, but it's, it's, it's frustrating. And the whole community cares about getting things right, and certainly the thing that, that I'm interested to me in my administration is getting this fixed as quickly as we can help get it fixed, and I appreciate the council's efforts towards that too. But secondly, is addressing the two issues that I saw as weakness in our processes that will ensure this never happens again because it was because of those weaknesses, I think, partly that we're here. Certainly, like I said, there are three sides to every story. I can only control the city side of it as far as the administration goes, and I've done that. Thank you. The, the, two, the change is, is that you talked about the informality. Uh, of the way that that we were approving projects and it really the, the the second one you said was verbal approvals what was the first change the, the first one was about how we handle um, requests for revisions to plans uh, there were the developer requested certain revisions to these plans uh, that that got approved by staff but did not receive the level of review by staff that I was happy with can I take a step back on that, Todd? Yeah, yeah just for, for help to help the council understand how this works. The city goes, so the city receives construction plans. And it's, they're distributed to all of our staff, our review staff. We ultimately get to a point where we approve site plans or site plan approvals. And the site plan approval includes sheets on all utilities, um, landscaping, drainage, make sure the units all meet setbacks and everything. 
Well, in this particular case, um, um, well, I don't need to get into the details, I guess, but the, the, I just wanted to put things in perspective or, or context is that what happened was the retention area on this project, um, the, the, in particular the inlet, storm inlet down near uh, the, the Fillmore Avenue itself, um, during the construction project or the, a, after site plan was approved, during the construction, the, the builder came to our public works uh, department and, 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 and asked for that change. And so that change was granted and, and we, we um, it, I think that's what Todd was tightening up is we now have a process where, where requests like that will actually fill out an application They'll submit plans. It'll be distributed to those in, those those in, internal as well as external uh, um, regulatory agencies, depending on the request. It'll follow a process. It'll come back, and it'll, it'll all be documented. That may not have, having this procedure in in place at that time may not have affected the end result, but it would sure give a lot better documentation about well how it happened because the, the contractor who the city is in the relationship with through the permit has the authority to request a revision. Even if their, their client doesn't want it to happen, their client is not the person that's in the relationship with the city, it's the contractor. So the contractor has the authority to request a revision even if their client doesn't want it. That becomes an issue between the contractor and the client. But the city has the right and responsibility to review that request and can only grant it or deny it to that permit holder or the qualifier, the person with whom we have a legal relationship. Mm -hmm. um, we're not required to go out and check with their client to see if they also want this change. It, in this case, this is a change the client clearly did not want, but again, we don't have that responsibility or that relationship with the homeowner. We have what was the the what's, which one of the changes is this example? Uh, Dave was referring to the stormwater inlet on Harrison. I'm sorry. In the driveway? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. It was supposed to be here, and it was, it, was supposed, it was here. It was supposed to be moved here, but then it ended up staying here. That was the mm -hmm. request, and that was what got approved. So we could feel, still theoretically approve that in a future job that might have that same thing, but it has to be done according to the new procedure, which means... In this case, not only is the public works director going to look at it, but the whole development review committee is going to have a, a look at this to, and make sure it gets documented properly. We've used words like builder, developer, contractor, owner, client. We should be using the word qualifier. Not contractor? It's, it's, it's the same thing, but in the terms of the um, Florida statute, it's qualifier. Did we not have a contractor for we this did. job? We Who's did. the contractor? Andre Baez with ABC. ABC mm -hmm. is the contractor. The permit was able to be pulled because there was a contractor license. Yes, and it was Andre Baez. Gary is not a contractor. No, but he had the authority of the contractor because the, the, the contractor can authorize an agent. Did we verify that authorization? I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I, I'd have I understand to how qualifying works through the yeah, Department yeah. of DBPR, but in this case, we have a site plan submitted with Ron Eboli's name. We then have a engineering plans, or I guess construction plans, or portion thereof, with Cape 3. <laughs> Cape 3 is a private LLC owned by... I don't know if it's an LLC. It's a, it's a, it's a it Florida is. business. It is an LLC. Owned by three individuals, mm -hmm. Ron, Gary, and... Gary's sister. Sis, Susan. I believe that's his sister, yes. Cape 3 is owned by three individuals who do not have a license. I, I, Which is why our permit goes to the qualifier. So do, does our... That, that is... I think a major issue because if we haven't verified, it doesn't sound like who Ron is and or their license and or who Gary is as the developer, the city should have a relationship, correct me if I'm wrong, with the contractor. Because correct. 
that's who has the authority to pull a permit. To qualify, and, right. and that's why if you look at our new form that we've just pre prepared, at the bottom of the form, it's signed by the qualifier, or the language in there says by the qualifier or somebody authorized to act on his so or her behalf. That's allowed also under statute that the qualifier can authorize an agent to act on his or her behalf. If, this, if the contractor uh, had any liability or issue, we would not go after or, or in the, 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 the qualifier. No, we, we, we do have, that, that is the person we're in privity with. We have the relationship with the qualifier. I'm not sure that we don't, we don't, are we saying that ABC concrete or asphalt has went through DBPR and qualified Gary as an actual qualifier? Basically, he has extended his license to I'm not saying another that individual, because that's what I understand as a qualifier is. is I'm, I'm not saying that happened. I haven't heard anything that would justify why we would not work directly with ABC. We, yeah. we do work directly with ABC, and I've, I've seen emails directly with ABC, and I don't know if Mike wants to talk about the relationship that ABC has with Mr. Wittekind. Uh, I'm assuming there's paperwork well, that show that the, connection. Where I'm going is, here's, here's the example why. Gary, I believe you said for this revision, came to our public works department. Gary is not a contractor. Gary owned a, a, a company that I think owned the property before they sold it. He was, T3 was a property owner, I would assume. Yeah, right? I, I, yes, but I think your question is, was Gary Whittakind an authorized agent of Android Baez? Yes, yes. that'd be the question. Yes, what's the and answer? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Mike, do you know the answer to that? Okay, so we'll have to verify that in the file. Okay. But it's a good, it's a great question, and it's an important question because we have to have a line of responsibility, and our our new procedure, and our new forms, guarantee that. But I, I like the new, and these are administrative procedures. I think the existing law today and the code today tells us that we work with the contractor. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we yes. don't need a new rule. Or, or his or that, that, her authorized agent. We're still allowed to work with their authorized agent. I think within a short period, we could go to sun, or, uh, and see if there's a DBPR qualification on Cape 3. And I have not, that's the there's, first time I've heard this. That, authorize, that authorization okay. is not a DBPR thing I'm talking about. So we're yeah. not talking they're, about they're not required. The authorized right. agent does not have to be. It's, it can be a power of attorney letter. It could be anybody, it could be it you. Could, we, but we did not verify that. I've asked Mike to find it in the file. It, it would be, okay. So, so I hope that was captured, that, that we wanna make sure we're talking to the permit, the licensed contractor. Definitely. And then the, on the other side was who that developer, uh, unverified person, had the authority to go to our public works department? Does our public works department have the authority to approve a change? That's what actually happened, and, and that would be the appropriate person to lead that uh, re review. Mm -hmm. But this change that I put in place would require that request now to not only go to the public works director, but the entire development review committee. But who out of all those people on the committee has the authority to approve the change? Well, the building official is the person who's responsible for approving ultimately changes to the permit scope. And that's the way our code and law is written today. And we don't Florida, need a change, that's the way it's always been. And Florida statute supports that. Okay, so a unverified contractor or authorized unverified came to an unauthorized person for an approval. I'm not saying that. Sounds we, like that's what We I'm have yet to determine whether or not he was authorized. I've asked okay. Mike to find that in the file. Let's assume he was not. I, I, I wouldn't make that assumption, but we- Well, we, I want to. Okay. I'm saying let, let, let's assume that he, that would be an issue. Yes, that would be an if issue. He, if he was, to your point, 
it would be fine. So fine, we'll, we'll see on that. Public works input is crucial. I understand that, to, just like fire and whoever else is on the, the committee. But the, but the building inspector is kind of where the buck stops. Building official. Ends. Building official, I'm yes. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, why do we need a new process to correct those issues? The, the path that that went down was just the wrong path from my understanding. And it's okay, but if that was a problem, I don't want to create especially administrative rules that really are within your purview. I want to look at what exists today and, and recognize that it actually works just fine. And when we verify authorization, when we ver work with the contractor and we make sure that the right person on behalf of the city is approving those changes. The so the verbal, is there an issue with, I mean, I can't imagine that verbal approval, it, it comes down to Mr. German's signature, right? And so that sort of takes the verbal out of it, right? It, it's, there, that, it's in writing. So when the change, what was the verbal approval? Verbal approval was the city engineer calling Mike German saying the, the swale is good and I'm approving it. Well, I think we're talking about the public works director approving okay. the, uh, out or, in the field, approving the change order to the, yeah. to the I, inlet. Are we talking about the inlet or the swale? Were both of those verbal approval issues? Yes. So we're talking about both, I guess. Okay. I'm just trying to take the issue away and more look at does what we have today work <laughs> and the verbal it, it requires a, a signing off so the city engineer is someone who our our building official needs to obviously consult with to ensure um, that, that, that they can approve it is the, and the city engineer sent written letters in this case, but now, now I'm getting, that's swale related, but yeah. going back to why, why do we need, is verbal even allowed today? I don't think it is. And so as a reminder, it's great, but, but isn't it required that these things are in writing already? This, that's what the stamp of the engineer is all about, and the, the letterhead, and, and, the, and, and certainly our building official. Again, we're talking about a revision. That requires a new stamp. If it's an engineering design that's being revised, yes. Yeah. So let's take one of them so we're not overlapping. Okay. The inlet on the front. The original plans were permitted and approved mm -hmm. somewhere before the Hearst purchased the property. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the revision yes. was made. It, the, yes. And so that revision did require a, a new stamp or, or to be Restamped by the yeah, Mike Allen, that would the be engineer. Th I believe we got that through the as built correct? Mm -hmm. Mike Allen stamped yes, that. Yes, that is correct. Your statement is correct. So where was the issue? The issue is not um, about the building official signing off approval. We, we all agree that has to happen. It's the steps that take place before that that are administrative that make that I wasn't comfortable, where there weren't enough eyes on it, on these requests. That's why we put this new procedure in place. We want more eyes on this before it gets to the building official so he has the assurance that we've looked at this every way we need to look at it before he signs it off. Okay. Um, 
do we have any understanding of why the public works director allowed the change? You want to speak to that, Dave? Uh, the, the quick answer is no. I, I, I wasn't privy to that conversation. Uh, I know there was some communication between um, the pr public works director and Mike, basically informing Mike of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, um, but as far as what was in the public works, what his thinking was or why he allowed it, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Fillmore Avenue is known for flooding. It's literally in our, in our analysis and resiliency plan used the photograph that is in there is the, is the Fillmore Homes being con under construction with shovels and broken ground, it's probably right in the middle of construction, and the whole street's flooded. And so this drain that was originally in the plans enhanced and improved stormwater runoff and was calculated by Mike Allen to be suitable. We reduced that capacity from an eight inch pipe to an 18 inch pipe or excuse me, it went from an 18 inch down to, and just kept the existing, I think, eight inch today. Were the original plans exceeding the minimum requirements? Why, were, why was it recommended to increase the drain and what new information came that says, no, we don't need to do that anymore? on a street that floods. I don't have that information, Dave, do you? All I can say is that Mike Allen provided an as-built with the new dimensions of the, um, of the stormwater system to include the inlet and the pipes. Mm -hmm. He signed and sealed those. And typically those are, um, um, when he signs and seals a document, he is certifying that it meets, um, um, I'll call it, city ordinance okay and I, I just want to add something else as well that before this is all said and done and I've, I've been very clear on this from the get-go is that we are going to require Allen engineering to come out and to recertify the stormwater system on this entire prop property or project um, um, because we've, um, you know, there, the, we, we had an approved site plan that John Picard reviewed. All the drainage calcs were submitted. John reviewed those, met minimum city requirements. Things have changed since then. Um, and so I think we're going, I shouldn't say I think, we're going to have Alan recertify the entire stormwater system. Okay, thank you. I am, I, I, give me a moment here. So the proposed, we're at 4.14 p.m. The proposed actions in here, I think, from the information we've heard today, some of them are underway, but, but I think they will help solve those issues. FPL came to the site 2.30, you said today? No, they, they were having a meeting, internal, an FPL meeting at 2.30 today, or 2.15. I was made aware shortly before the meeting that they did go to the site. Okay. <coughs> and the information I was given was that the property owner had to explain, and this is Florida Power and Light's contractor, property owner had to explain to them that the plan they originally made was not going to work because the pole box in the yard. The hand box goes to all four residents, not two, and the contractor himself said that they will ne not get it done by next week, knowing this new information. It will take another week, according to the, the contractor, to do it, and they will have to get back on a schedule for it, along with the power outage 
at the end of the day, they're going to have to dig up against the buildings and in the yards of all four units. Did we have any idea that they were going to come to the site today? Did we know no. that? I, I didn't like, know. like I mentioned earlier, Mayor, this has been very frustrating. FPL does what they want when they want, and, and we, we are not we are not privy to their time schedule. The, and, and so, when we go to the recommendation recommended steps um, city clerk it's the first set of bolded items one through six obtain plans in, number three obtain plans and confirmation on a date for FPL to remove the overhead lines and reinstall the line underground consistent with code the FPL uh, I guess in their electric services handbook or whatnot they 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 don't have complete right free reign. I don't know maybe as much as you do now, but I think in the letter from Gary, he said that they did not provide FPL with any direction on whether to go underground or above ground. So FPL does not require any direction from an unauthorized person, just to add to it, they're, they're engaging again the same issue as earlier with Gary, who was unverified to speak on behalf of the contractor. I guarantee you FPL has some sort of requirement to speak with the contractor, and they need to verify. And so the second thing is that they The plans did not state underground or above ground. They said, if above ground, do this. If below grade underground, do this. How in the world is that the way it works? FPL, has, if that is the way it works, to where FPL has no direction on the plans, and they do not take any direction from the owner, they don't need to follow our city code that requires underground utilities? The contractor, sorry, the qualifier is always responsible for following code. Ultimately, it always comes down to the qualifier. If he misses something because he didn't read that page of our code book, he's still responsible for it. So FPL does something wrong and it's the contractor's issue? The contractor, the yes. qualifier is fully 100% responsible, yes, sir. The contractor, I know we keep, it, it, which if an issue arise, it, it would come back to ADC. Always. Okay. I, that's where I think getting in to, to some of these items is going to help clear this up. And I'm not sure that, that the developer, qualifier, authorized agent is that at all. And I don't know, but it doesn't sound like it to me. And it is unfortunate they couldn't be here tonight. I would like to be a part of the next meeting. Okay. If that happens, Please and so. if any other council's members want to be a part of it, you, the one we would has, need to schedule another meeting. You're but referring to the one he has with me? It, it, yes. Yes, or, Lisa, or when is that? not that. Yes. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock in my office. Okay. And uh, for some reason, if I can't make it, Mayor Pro Tem, if you'd be available or another council member available and to take some notes would be very much appreciated. And keep in mind, this is a meeting that he requested because he wanted to meet with me. I think that's an important one because I think there's some information I hope that we verify and there, his authority because what a waste of time to meet with somebody who does not have the authority or, or qualifications. And has any of us met with Mr. Baez or ABC because if we don't know, we can't call him the qualifier, just like I can't say he's not a qualifier. So let's just say we definitely know ABC is the contractor. 
I requested and Mr. Baez be present at the two o'clock meeting as well. Did he accept? He will be there too. That's excellent. Thank you, Lisa. I know we're not going to figure it all out today, but on the building side with Fillmore Avenue, my hope is that these action items help tell the story a little bit more and we can be proactive and work towards it. Switching gears to Jackson Avenue briefly, and it, those items, I'd like to get feedback from city manager, council. Are there any concerns with any of those items and or well, we can wrap up Fillmore Avenue first. Are there a concern with Fillmore Avenue, any of the action items that we've requested? I don't think. Do we need it? Is it, is it a consensus that we all agree that we need it? Yes, I'm asking the city manager prior to doing that um, if there's a concern or issue or things that we would like to add or take away from these items. Well, um, if we could go through them. So if I understand, council will be making a motion um, to direct staff to provide this information. So yeah, let's go through them. Obtain and distribute a current building inspection report showing compliance and any existing violations with all applicable codes to the city council for all property. Dave, any issues with providing that report? No, okay. I mean, uh, other than the, no. That's obtain fine. an engineering Happy field inspection report and review of all existing plans, letters, calculations submitted by Allen Engineering. So these are all existing existing Allen Engineering field inspection reports, plans, letters, and calculations. And from city engineer John Picard, so whatever's in the file um, from those two um, individuals to identify. What is, what is the file? Um, is the, that BSNA? Everything that we have is uploaded to BSNA. Everything, so if it exists, it's in BSNA? Yeah, Mike, is that correct? Okay. Right, but as far as um, Allen Engineering documents, John Picard documents, they're all gonna be in BSNA. So I, any, Going to I, be or are today? They should be in there they're today. In there. They're in there today. They're in there today? Yes. Okay, I, that's yeah. great, thank I you. Just, I just wanna mention too, and this is just for consideration, is that there, an engineering report obviously will be prepared by an engineer. Um, and they're about two hundred and fifty dollars. He's, an he's hour. asking for existing reports. Obtain an engineering I'm field inspection report. I'm, I'm sorry, it's existing. Well, I think Todd, we're uh, city manager. We're still on number one, which is existing violations. Okay. And then David, you're correct too. On I'm sorry, I jumped to number two. I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm referring to number two. Our, my un understanding is that we're looking for existing documentation here. Uh, obtain an engineering field ins respection report. Of all existing and, plans. And no, no. Plans. And review of all existing plans. So David, yes, that is what I meant. Okay, so a new field inspection report. A, th a yes. third party engineer come in. Yes. Do it, do, review all of the paperwork, prepare a report for all of us so we can kind of see based on that information. That's what I assumed, and I just want to mention that that's going to be, it's going to take a little bit of time, and it's going to be, it could potentially become quite expensive. Um, I'm, and I'm not saying we don't do it. I'm mm -hmm. just saying I just want the council to be aware of that. But we're, we're happy to Yes, we're happy that. to do it. Yeah. Happy to do it. Um, if that's what council wants, understanding there will be a cost associated with that. Absolutely, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, re and review of all existing plans, letters, and calculations submitted by these two firms. Um, I think that's what the rest of that number two is saying, a review of all existing engineering documents for the files, for these addresses. We can provide all that, absolutely. Certainly. Mm -hmm. And you, Dave, you had said that um, Allen Engineering is gonna recertify the stormwater. Would that be part of this too? Well, they haven't done it yet. We're wait, we're going to have to wait till all the all the dust is cleared after LP, FP and L has done their their two phases, and the uh, contractors come back in and, and finalize the the the, uh, re, the stormwater swale. So at that point, we'll have Allen come in and and recertify it, which will be some of some of the information in two will be contained or will be produced. And any timeline? 
Well, if my 14 pages of letters are any indication, uh, it's going to be a while. But let's be optimistic, and let's say if they plan on doing this in the next couple of weeks based on the information that the mayor just, just shared with us, um, and if, if they come back in and immediately thereafter and do phase two, according to Mr. Wittenkind's letter, he said he's going to come in immediately after FPL does their work. So I'm going to say optimistically in the next month. Don't hold me to that. And verify. I, I'm giving you what I've heard from just in real time. This is kind of happening as we speak, so please. So I, if, if we're good with one and two, let's move on to number three. Mm -hmm. Obtain plans and confirmation on date for FPL to remove overhead lines. I, I have to say I cannot get confirmation from them. All I can do is request plans and confirmation. I cannot guarantee that I can obtain plans and confirmation because they're an outside agency. Who has a franchise agreement with the city right. that we don't have the right to know what they intend to do before they do it. We can request. The city attorney. We, FPL can hold their, their plans and say, you'll find out whether it's above ground or underground after we build it. I mean, I would, I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't provide that information. I would request it. Yeah, we can request it. But I, I don't want to be held to a standard of obtaining if it's impossible to obtain. All we can do is request it. If they do not, if they choose not to give it, we can't be held responsible for that. So I would ask that if, is there any law or policy that we can leverage a uh, city attorney that says per section, please provide the plans? Um, and, and as diplomatically as possible, uh, but I, I don't. I mean, I'll take a look at the franchise agreement to see if there's anything in there. Is this I mean, typically, I mean, they, they operate under a PSC issued tariff, okay? So they're subject to PSC rules and regulations. So with respect to the installation of underground utilities for residential homes, you know, they, they have a process. The tariff addresses how they do that. Um, so, you know, like I said, I mean, I think it's fair to ask under the circumstances, you know, for the plans and schedule and and coordinate with FPL because of the, the issue. Um, you know, but I, I mean, I'd be happy to take a look and see if there's any, any law that we can hang over their head, but just keep in mind, they are regulated by the PSC. So if needed, that's helpful. Sure. I, I think with Michelle and the help there, we can get a response. I hope so. And likewise, obtain confirmation on a date. Um, again, that's, I can't confirm when they're going to be there. I can confirm when they say they're going to be there. But if they don't show up that day be because of X or Y, you know, that's. Well, they have to schedule the work. Yeah. And they've done that twice now. And it so hasn't whenever happened. the next schedule is, there yes. has to be some predictability to their efforts for these property owners and for us. Right. It can't be surprise. <laughs> Agree. And so. Uh, so I think number three, I would revise to say request plans and request date for FPL to remove overhead lines. We can do that, certainly. Okay. All right. I, I, Number four, I similarly, obtain plans and confirmation on a date for the licensed contractor to complete the improvements recommended by the engineering firm. So I think the recommended by rec, improvements recommended by the engineering firm would be. It's just, it's just the build to the plan. I mean, the. There's not a recommendation from the engineering firm, Dave, since this has come out. Is well, there? I, th I think what this says is that based on what we find out in number two, correct, we're going to those those improvements that come out of step number two are going to be completed. Step number two, you're referring to the engineered field inspection report. Yes, the third yes, party. So, so, so I don't know the formal document name or what's needed, but. Number one was about a building inspector going out, giving a report with some 
recommendations. Mm -hmm. Number two is about the engineer going out, putting together a report mm -hmm. with the recommendations. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. Three was electric utility. I don't see the word recommendations in number one. It, it's, it's not, but okay. we can add that in. So let's go back to number one again. Obtain and distribute a current building inspection report showing compliance and any existing violations with all applicable codes to city council for all property owners and recommendation on what? Well, well, we don't even need to add it. If there's not compliance, right? I think that that's pretty self-telling that we need to. So no recommendations in number one. But number two. Well, yeah, let's, for the sake of clarity, let's add in recommendations, but I really don't think it's needed. A I'm recommendation on around the word. Do you understand what I'm trying to? I, I believe I do, but I, 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 I want to make sure Mr. I Morley's. <laughs> I, I'm the one that needs to understand this. What are we asking for a recommendation yes. on? Agreed. Uh, any any existing violations? A recommendation on violations. So uh, to, to I, make I, sure that they're compliant. Yeah, I, I think I think what number one says is, hey, we want to get. I think the practicality of it is we want a, a, a building inspector or a building official who has all the credentials to come in, take a look at the situation, and see what existing violations there are with applicable city codes and issue a report. Yes. Informing and I would us hope of that report has yeah, so it's, identified it's, any com issues with compliance. Okay. So I identify we say remaining issues. Or not, right. I'm recommending that we fix those there. So I don't want to have to uh, amend too much, but. Okay, so it's identifying the remaining issues. Build from, from a building, F, from an FBC standpoint. Right. Excuse me, Florida Building Code standpoint, FBC. So moving on to number two, obtain engineering field inspection report. Is that a status of existing conditions and recommendations from, from that same report? That same report needs to include recommendations? I want an, a, an a engineer to look at Allen Engineering's plans, John Picard's letters and plans, and to bring a third party view to the engineering and the calculations. I'd like to know how much that's gonna cost. Me for, too. Before we make any judgment yeah. on that or decision. Okay, so revise number two to obtain a cost for engineering field inspection report of all these things. Um, the engineering, uh, the review of the existing documents. Yes, I mean, I, I think we, we'd want to know the cost, uh, but uh, do we have any idea on a residential engineering plans what that would cost? Well, what, 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 what number two is asking is basically to I don't want to say re-engineer the site, but just review Allen's plans and determine whether it's consistent with city code and what, if currently, what are the shortfalls? What are the, what are the identified issues? So it could take an engineer to review and to review all the documents. And I mean, I, Mayor, I don't know. It could be, I don't know. Regardless, we're going to get a price first. I, but it's reviewing the, 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 the design created by Allen Engineering, anything that Don Picard did, and also looking at the existing condition, putting it all in a report, and right. making a recommendation. And making recommendations. Yes. That and making recommendations could get very expensive. Right. That's where the expense is going to be because that, 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 a lot, that, that opens up He's going to be basically engineering, providing you engineering options on fixing whatever change, whatever issues he finds, or her, he or she finds. So it could be at two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. I mean, you can kind of plug in the numbers. I, however many hours. Is there any hours. way to achieve basically the same thing without getting a new engineering? Can, is there another way to find mm -hmm. out that's that won't cost us? Uh, so another much? way to find out if Allen Engineering's design is good. Is that what you're asking? Well, to accomplish what we need so we can correct this. Well, the, the cheapest way out is to require the qualifier to comply with the design and then have it inspected and, as Dave said, have Allen Engineering do a full report at the end. 
that's what we were already planning to do. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what Alan, that's what we're expecting Alan to do at the end of the project, is to recertify it, certify it that it meets city code. When he stamps and, when he signs and seals that document, that's, that's what he's saying. Um, you know, the, the council can certainly get a third party engineer and get them involved, I mean, but theoretically, as I understand it, the, the developer and the, and the qualifier intend to follow Allen Engineering's design. Sure. Uh, original design for the swale. And they, theoretically, they would do that, and that would be verified by an inspection by our current city engineer when it's done. Yes, I'm asking for intervention prior to that. Right. And I yeah. think it's worth spending money. Cheaper okay. is not better in this circumstance. Um, a, a quality engineering firm that can look at this. And if re-engineering. Mayor, I just, I, I'm, I certainly am gonna do what the council wants done, but mm -hmm. I, I think, I'm just gonna say, it's just on the face of it, spending taxpayer dollars on an engineering firm to come in and. We'll, we'll deal with the citizens on that. <laughs> okay. All okay, right, so we'll I, get a, I respect that. We'll get a Thank cost you. on that. And I respect you. We'll get a cost on that. So number three, we said it's just request the plans and confirmation on date. Number four, should similar be request plans and confirmation on date for the contractor to complete the improvements recommended by the design engineering firm. That's step number two. And building inspection report for many items above such as not limited to the swale in the backyard. So uh, building inspection report, I believe that would be an item number one, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's kind of a duplication. Which number are you on for? Um, on number four? Yeah. So well, I, th I think number four is actually going out and making the changes that yes. number one identify. Yes, it's, it's. Okay, gotcha. And the results of number one, thank right. you. Okay. Right. okay. All right, number five, city manager, city attorney present any findings and or opportunities in a report to be distributed to the council on ways the city can improve our community development department. Um, I'd be glad to um, present in writing the things that we discussed as far as the improvements go. Uh, um, I don't know if Anthony wants to add anything to that. Well, to the extent that you want to uh, consult with me regarding your processes, I'd be happy to do that with you. All right, we'll um, submit the uh, process changes to Anthony, let him review it. Comment Definitely. On it. Yeah. But I got a question, because um, I'm not quite following it entirely. I mean, I understand that there's an issue with FPL poll. I understand that there's an issue regarding the swale. And I, and I understand that where you're going with number two. You know, I know the building officials here, Todd. Um, you're a former building official. I'm not quite sure I understand where the council's going with respect to number one. Um, I think what the mayor's requesting is that we review current reports available for all inspections that were done to see if there are any um, code violations that remain and there's anything that didn't get approved. What do you mean by didn't get approved? So when the building and official- We're dealing, we're dealing with four- Let me give you an example, city attorney. The overhead power lines were not an issue brought to my attention by the Hearst. They had some concerns about how FPL early they were emailing about digging the uh, swale in the back and the concern of how much cover was over the power lines that was working through. It was not until later, I believe our city manager, to your point, former building official who, lucky, who noticed the lines. This is after the building inspector was done. And so what I'm saying is, is what if Todd would have kept going through that property and looking through? Are there other issues? Because we can't expect the property owner to, to do that. And, and if it means Mike or whoever, our city manager, think going back through, fine. Um, I, I would, I hope that that was the goal. Okay, I'm, d I'm, a, maybe I'm just misunderstanding and I just got confused between one and two because number two seems to be like retaining a new engineer to kind of go out there and do another inspection. So you, mm -hmm. I think I, I understand now number one is regarding the all the building inspection reports, the history of the building permits that were issued for the for this project. 
and, and the various inspections that were conducted and the results okay. of those inspections. That were, okay, yes. in the past tense. Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right. I understand that now. Okay. Sorry. And I think we're through um, five and six. Is any other actions the City Council or City Administration uh, seems appropriate? Um, unless there's anything else. Um, I'm okay with all that as long as we understand that um, number two is a cost estimate and number three and four is request instead of obtain. Would it exceed $5,000? Likely. Yes, and likely. It's probably between five and 10, my guess. Okay, I would say um, uh, get three competitive quotes, take the lowest of the three. Well, it's not going to breach a threshold where you'd need to bring it back to council. We have, um, through our CCNA process, negotiated rates with Kimley Horn to do these services for us. They're, they're, they're already competitive rates, okay. part of that agreement. It would be a matter of um, getting them to plug in the number of hours is all. Okay. I think I would have an issue spending that much money when there's a, a t um, option that we can do, you know, resolve it in the, this, a different way. So that's something I would definitely want to and we recently approved some reports from Kimberly Horn. <laughs> Would this train potentially be in those since they're taking a look at the entire city? Because they're already in place, correct? Not the, not the okay. same issues. I, I think I think Council Member Jackson that what what number two is talking about is more of a on site yeah, and, and uh, examination problem. versus once. Once you get into the right of way, that's where Kimley Horn's study really kicks in. This is this would be more of a on site on, okay, on these so four properties in themselves. So it's in the part of the sidewalk that is that are, or is in the driveway, which is well, it, not part of the easement. It's actually the the backyard. Oh, okay. Um, the side yard between mm -hmm. the units out to the collection box in the in the right of way. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I want to be sure that we don't give the homeowners false hope here. Let's see that we, we as a council need to commit to this because I don't want to see a price come back and we say, well, wait a minute, because we're already extending them as homeowners, anticipating however long this is going to take. So we either need to commit to it or find another way. I think I think we we find that money and if we're going to do it, let's do it. Um, resolve the thing mm -hmm. and not wait for a competitive bid. I mean, we want to get the best price, and if that's a competitive bid, that's fine. But we're committed to it. We're going to do it, and not have an if on this thing. Because I think this is this process. For the homeowners has gone on long enough and I don't think we should be exacerbating the, the timeline. Okay. Yes. Mayor for Jim. Um, I agree with Council Member Willis. Um, I think we should commit to it and do it. Um, and I, you know, trust that uh, city manager will get the best price. Um, but I think if we find other mistakes or things that happened with with these inspections, that it could pay down the road with ordinances or policies um, that we need to change to fix that this doesn't happen again. So, you know, if you take that amount of money and spread it around for things that could happen in the future, it's mm -hmm. um, something that we need to do. My question is, is the money budgeted? Where would it come from? I know John's not here. He left at a good time, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect timing. I mean, um, I, Dave, it would have to come out of your contract services budget line item. There you go. There's your answer. It come out of the community and economic development budget. The what? I'm sorry. It come out of my budget, community and economic development. So, Mayor, I, I don't have any opposition to uh, one through five as amended. Be happy to Thank you. provide. Thank you. 
So are we still getting a quote and then we'll, we'll decide if we're going to spend it or what are we doing? Well, that's a good point. Uh, we'd like some clarification on that. Yeah, Thank please. you. I think okay. that we are, my, my opinion would be to move ahead, um, you know, we'll find the money and get this done and not make the people wait any longer than they already have to resolve this issue. And like I said, if we get more information from this that helps with planning down the road um, and straightening out our policies or inspections, whatever it needs to do, it's well worth it. The ob obtaining um, the engineering field inspection report and recommendations likely not speed up anything for them. But I was gonna ask, if we get this report, mm -hmm. it's not gonna make FPL get out there any quicker no, it's, in, in it's fact, not gonna. It's not necessarily gonna speed up the process. So. It, I, I'm just now realizing. I, it, I fear that the developer will say, "Oh, now what's the city gonna surprise me with in this report?" And it might cause him to pump the brakes. That has no bearing on what FPL does, though. In the meeting tomorrow is oh, dependent agreed, on agreed. The FPL. Agreed. I think number three doesn't need to wait on one and two. Those can all three, you know, start in parallel or. I mean, what three is happening. No, you know, yeah, but I think number two could affect number four. Number two should affect number four. That's the point. I mean, we were concerned about spending $7,500 to get the estimate about the underground water tanks. To, you know, that was a lot of money that people were debating on spending, and now we're gonna spend this money, and when there may be a possible way to avoid it with those, the process that is in place. That's my only concern. I'd like to know where it's coming from, and I mean, I know where it's coming from, but it's yeah. not budgeted. Sounds obviously. like it's so. That's my, you know, $7,500 the other day was a lot, but this isn't a lot, and this is on the, t you know, this is on the city. Well, that's to my point I made earlier. We seem to move on with new projects, mm -hmm. new things, the civic hub. When these prop property owners have been dealing with this for how long? I understand that. So we always jump ahead and we don't take care of what things that are festering in the city. I understand that, but just because we do this does not mean it's going to go forward quickly because we have to wait for FPL. So just because we get an engineer doesn't mean an uh, engineering report doesn't mean it's going to happen next month when FPNL may come out in two months from now. So we don't have control really of FPNLs. Well, I don't schedule. think that the, the urgency or the FPL has anything to do with right. the engineering problems or the swale problems. Yeah, it's not I mean, dependent. It's, on it. it's not dependent on FPNL. Yes, if you look at number two, it specifically is talking about the existing drain and pipe and the FPL laying their facilities underground. That's not in relation to that. So there's really no reason that we shouldn't move forward. Um, just like ever, we've all discussed it, literally they've had water coming up to their, <laughs> their doors almost and it's been an issue, an ongoing issue. I'm all for moving forward. I just want a price before we commit. Because if it comes out $20,000, I mean, we don't know what it's, I would like an estimate of how much it's gonna cost before we commit. I'm all for moving forward. I'm all for getting this settled and get this done for the homeowners. But I want to know the price before so we don't commit on a large amount of money. This is why contingencies exist. Have we used all of our contingency funds? I don't think so. If not, I think this is appropriate. And we're obtaining three bids. Um, so three you're four. willing to commit to a project not knowing if it's going to be $5,000, $10,000, or $20,000 right now? I have enough faith that our city manager is not going to sign a bloated contract. If it exceeds $10,000, I'll pump the brakes and I'll report to council. And we've got a meeting another three weeks. We can talk about it then. Or I can email you okay. some about it. But um, we do have a CCNA contract with Kinley Horn. We should be using them, not getting the three bids. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. yeah so the, the three bids is okay. So we're using Kimberly Horn. Okay. Well, so I have, um, I have an issue about 
you brought up the point about the contractor builder pumping the brakes. Mm -hmm. What recourse do we have on them if this report comes back and, and lays out extensive changes that they're not unwilling or, you know, they're not willing to do? We've taken the first step. We've identified the problem. And we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I think if there's a, I think one of the things the mayor is trying to get at here for, he uses an example, is about the, um, the expanded drain um, and the changed size of that pipe. Uh, so if, if that gets reviewed and analyzed in this engineering fluid inspection report by Kinley Horn and they have a problem with it, with Allen Engineering's design, then we would take that and pr give it to Allen Engineering and say, is there a good engineering practice that wasn't followed here, Allen Engineering? And that then becomes an issue. But if they say, this looks good, Allen, I agree with your calculations, it was the right decision to make, then we don't have a problem. But, but to your point, we have to understand that we could be creating a conflict if they have an engineering disagreement on, on something that was already approved um, as, and revised. And you've got, you've got an engineer of record here. Allen Engineering is the engineer of record on, on this. Um, we would be essentially possibly presenting refuting evidence that they, them as the engineer of record uh, give, provided a faulty design. John Picard, our former city engineer, was going to the site doing field inspections, mm -hmm. coming back with letters, coming back with reviews. Kimley Horn has now stepped into those shoes continue that work, get caught up on John Picard's work and letters, understand what, what, what was happening, certainly review Al Engineering's work and keep the momentum going. Do not wait till it's finished. Have a, a, a step that, that says, we're gonna, we're gonna get into this and understand it. And to Council Member Jackson's point, Kimley Horn's great because you know, learning about that development, how it impacts the, the flooding around the neighboring communities. Maybe, maybe the way we ask, maybe we, when we ask Kimley Horn to do this task, we ask them to review, inspect, and let the city council know in a report if they have any concerns about the operation being completed, the operation as, as designed, when it's finished, do they have any concerns about that being completed that way that we need to know about? I want them to, to go through a checklist. Comprehensive um, is, in, is important. And yeah, that I think what Mr. Picard was doing needs to be carried forward. Sure. Because he had concerns. Mayor, let me, let me also throw this out too, that I think our checklist is largely gonna consist of um, our stormwater requirements in city code. Mm -hmm. I mean, so those, those establish minimum stormwater requirements. And so I think, the, I think the analysis needs to perhaps be centered on that. Does the plan meet city stormwater requirements? For us to require things other than that, we're starting to get into some uh, mm, gray areas. That's a great starting point. That, that City makes engineer it. starts from the back of the, the swale and the, the entire stormwater plan. That's, that's, mm -hmm. and I think that would, that would be a good first step. Yeah, yeah so at, at the path forward, does, is it, does it appear it's going to meet all of our city code for stormwater? I think that's a, that's a fair question to ask. Yes, which is such as, but not limited to stormwater analysis. So what we've, in, in existing drain, in, in pipe compare, I mean, that, that's written out. Um, and I guess we are agreeing that the but not limited to, we're not gonna go beyond that. Yeah, yeah, okay. and, um, and not to exceed $10,000 at this point. Well, now I hope not with yeah. the, you know, they're not doing full structural and. No, 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 it's only it. limited to stormwater as I understand it. Yep, that's okay. great, okay. So um, just to recap, um, no issue with number one, just providing existing uh, reports 
Number two is not to exceed $10,000, get a, the engineering field report of, just like we discussed, will it meet city code for stormwater? Um, number three is request plans and confirmation. Number four is request plans and confirmation. And then number five is I will present to the city attorney our, uh, our findings and the things that we've done to implement improvements in the community development department. And he can opine on that and report to the city council. My hope is that you and the uh, city attorney, uh, once these, and simultaneously, you've already mentioned some improvements, but once you get this back, maybe there's some more that comes out of it. And this is, this is more of a moving forward lessons learned. And like I said, I think you're already on, underway with that, but we can factor this new data and information that comes to us. So, so one through five are clear to me. Dave, you good? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mayor. And Thank we you. Would just, we would just ask for con consensus or, or a vote as necessary. Council, are we okay with this? For Fine. Okay, we'll record consensus then. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. If we could take a, a brief 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll try to, I think we can go straight through that same exercise with Jackson, okay. and, and we can, sure. you can pick it up from the top and go down and make sure, sure you're clear. We'll, we'll reconvene it, um, yeah, in 10 minutes, okay. please. Okay, thank you. Okay, roll right into plan three. Yeah, it's gonna work out this way. That's all right.
Yep, I think that's good. All right, we'll get started here in uh, just a couple minutes. Um, we thank you very much. Um, just reminded, we got a P and Z board meeting at six o'clock p.m., and they certainly need time to come in, set up, and so maybe in the next ten to fifteen minutes, we can try to run through these final uh, set of recommendations and um, for the Jackson Avenue properties. And uh, yeah, so if we're all ready, I call the meeting back to order. Yes, sir. All right. It is 5:08 p.m. Call the meeting back to order, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, likewise, to the last, to the similar, uh, brief previous issue, I understand there's been a lot of frustration around um, this property um, for the tenants there, and, and Ellie Mays is a certainly a cherished gem in our community as a restaurant, as we've seen so many times. And uh, like the last one, there's no bad guys. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. So that's where this is coming from and this is where it's gonna end up. It's all it's gonna be, let's do all get it right and do the right thing. So we've got the six items here. First one, uh, we'll go through it just like the last one as Mayor requested. Um, provide a report generated from BSNA that shows all actions and correspondence related to code enforcement and the properties, owners, and tenants listed above on Jackson. So again, like the last one, it's a report of all the existing documentation. Uh, in, this, in this case, it's actions and correspondence that uh, are available. So any issues with that? Um, I just, just if I could go over something real fast, because um, one and five are kind of the same. And um, we have recognized, or I have recognized, and I think it was, um, it, it's been, it, it really came prominent to me when we had our meeting mayor with um, you and, and, the, and the city manager and the department director, that we had a big issue with um, documentation. Um, as we've all recognized. Mm -hmm. We had a program prior to this BSNA program that didn't, that was very basic and didn't take documentation inside the program. We did a lot of that documentation outside of the program. Um, it's been a battle, needless, needlessly to say, to get officers that were working in the old program to go to the new system and start documenting in the new system. Mm -hmm. I, I, re I recognize that as a, as a large issue. I implemented change um, the day after our meeting. I implemented change about that to, to um, make sure that everything is documented within the system. Um, so I, I am more than, more than happy to get all the stuff that I have, the documentation that we can find not necessarily will come from BSNA. I will get what's in BSNA. I'll also look other places that we have that documentation, make sure that it is put into BSNA, and then generate a report that shows that correspondence and what we've done, um, showing that case synopsis. Is, that's what we refer to it as. I'm willing to do that. I just can't guarantee that all the documentation is there we did a lot of verbal stuff in our cases back, you know, in, in the past that verbal wasn't always documented. That's not okay. Not something that's right. I'm not saying that it is. I understand. And we are correcting that as of today and moving forward with that. So if I was reading the correspondence in whatever format, January as an example, you know, in 2022, and then it's like, you know, the next is 11 months later, as an example. There might have been verbal communication that wasn't documented. Exactly. That's, that's okay. Exactly. And, and I appreciate all your comments there. So, yes, I, I think that as long as we know what we're looking, because you won't know until you get through it, what we're looking at. I accept today that, of course, there was verbal co communication that happened and whether it was documented or not okay you know the goal with the procedures moving forward is to try and log those notes and use it That's absolutely fair. so thank you so City mayor Manager. i think um with that analysis thank you brian if we're if we can get the best out of one and five by combining some of five into one and say yeah. re, um, provide a comprehensive report from bsna and all available city resources regarding the city's engagement with the properties located at 114, 16, 18, 20 Jackson for the past five years, 
including all correspondence related to code enforcement for the properties. I think we want to limit it to code enforcement. Is that correct? We don't want to see um, anything else. If there was um, a um, one, 110 related um, site plans or oh. building permits or special That's exceptions, right. rezonings, nothing like that. I think a lot of that building permit, we, one, one thing we learned, that department uses BSA, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. And they use it, and so I think we might already have a lot of that in there. Um, yeah, starting with code enforcement is is yeah. a, a good first step. So limit it to code enforcement, but go back the full five years, though, right? That's what we want the number one to do. Yes, and I'd say you know you start with this year, yeah. uh, and you go back to the next, and the goal is to try to get to five. You have yes. other enforcement. You have one officer. I'm not. I understand your limitations. But. Sure, we'll do that, and then um, not just BSNA, but Brian, any resources that you've got files. No, that's I'm going to purge yeah. everything and see okay. what we have. So that's how I understand number one, Mayor. Yes. Okay. Uh, number two, create and distribute administrative procedures reviewed and approved by our city attorney, complying with Florida state law and city code to be followed by city code enforcement officers. I spoke briefly about this with Brian during the break, and he's actually. Um, got something really worthwhile saying, Brian. I won't steal your thunder, go ahead. Uh, we, we administrative procedures we do have through our city code and uh, Florida statute. However, um, once I was uh, promoted to the position that I am now, I started a standard operating procedure handbook that I've been working on for about a year and a half now. And it, it outlines everything administrative procedures that outlines everything that a code enforcement officer should know do and how they're supposed to do it it also includes the the um the flow chart that was spoke of earlier it also includes that that shows the um the process that you must go through as a code enforcement officer um, i'm hoping to have that done in the next month or so and that's going to be presented to um uh, staff uh, the department director through the city manager, and then finally to the city attorney for approval to uh, implement a standard operating procedure handbook for code enforcement themselves because we've never really actually had that. You have to go to, um, to city code, which is Article 6. That outlines everything we do, or to Florida Statute 162. Mm -hmm. I would like to combine all of that and put it into a standard operating procedure approved by everybody so then we can go to one section and look. Plus, we're adding, we're adding where that documentation was uh, is lacking. We're, we've added that to say you must do this in BSNA, you must do that in BSNA. I've also added inside that um, that 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 standard operating procedure. I've also added in there kind of a checks and balances to where once a month I'll check on all cases, uh, open cases, to see where they're at and see what you know, what, what's happening with them, how long they've been on the books, what have you. Um, for for Miss Jackson's uh, point there, um, how long they've been on the books and how long we've been working through them. Because there are different things that, that, that um, can affect those dates. So it's already in the works. It's the good news. That and is very good news. Uh, Thank targeting you. Targeting about 30 days for completion of the Yes, draft. sir. Okay. Um, so that's how we'll do address number two, Mayor. Um, item three, provide a list of certifications and continuing education completed and ongoing for the city code enforcement officers to obtain regarding code enforcement at BSNA. I'd like to amend that just a little bit to say, provide a list of certifications and continuing education and training, right? Because there's other things that are not continuing education that are training um, that we also do. Completed and ongoing for the city code enforcement officers. Um, to obtain regarding, so this is going to be the stuff, you know, like uh, some of it's on how to deal with, you know, angry people, a, a training class on that, you know. I think that's kind of relevant to what your request is here. So let's let's include all that. And, uh, I, uh, can I add something real quick? Mm -hmm. Our, 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 um, our job descriptions also talk a little bit about um, face certifications and requirements. And we have expectations of our officers to reach certain face levels and certification. Faces, um, faces Florida, Florida Association of Code Enforcement. Yeah. Um, they're like the, they're the one is what we require? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, and we have, we have time frames. We expect the officers to reach these various levels. So we'll, 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 but that'll all be documented. Thank so, you. Yes, yeah, so all the face certifications, continuing education required for face and other training completed 
Um, so how far back do we want to go on the training? Um, well, the list, I mean, I just literally, um, when this was sent to me, this, this thing here, I literally just started to list all of mine and I took up, I was on, I was on a page and a half and that's current of my current certifications and my mm -hmm. current, uh, training. So, I, I mean, that's, that's what I'm currently certified mm -hmm. as. So I don't know, I mean, if you want that current, what everyone's current on, I mean, that's, that's the most useful. It, that's the most important. Because if you're not current on a certification, then you're not, it, it's not like it, 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 it's not like you can still do that. It, it's mm -hmm. a, you, you certify or you get training on something and every two years we have to stay current on that stuff. And that's what I mean by continuing education. Yes. I think the two, Every two years, it. 16, 16 uh, CEUs that we have to have to stay current on it. So once we get current on it, these, this is the list of everything that we're current on. That's great. Thank you. Yes, and, and while we can add people to the list, you know, expand code enforcement, um, improving and trying to be the, the best we can be is, I think, really good. And everything you're saying is moving in that direction by creating the SOPs, utilizing the software. I know how difficult it is to get adoption to, to use it and training. And so, um, and it's something I think we as a council can be proud of. And it's not to disqualify or anything. I know you have the credentials and, and we require the credentials. I've seen our job postings. I, it's, it's very clear what we expect. And the ongoing, if there's more that we can add and invest in, uh, I think this council would consider that too, you know, uh, whatever seems appropriate to say, hey, I, I want to work in this area and improve in this area. I know we, we're big about that and code enforcement, I think, plenty out there for that because it's oh, yeah. a very tough job. It's the hardest one in the city, if you ask me. Okay. Ask your question. Mayor Pro Tem, yes. Um, just a couple questions. Uh, you know, you talk about certification, and then you were saying that you it was hard for you to get people to document stuff in BNF, BSMA. Is there a certification that they have to be trained so often on that to um, get them to comply with putting the information where? No, because all it's a Florida Association of Code Enforcement that they're certified through, so it's all through Florida. So not all code enforcement um, agencies or departments or divisions, however you want to refer to it as, not all of them do the same thing we do. I, right. but, but speaking to that though, I think there, we could have potentially, we could have some kind of an internal requirement. Right. And that's in the SOP. It is in the SOP yes. that they that's have so much, so, much so much training on BSNA mm -hmm. um, each does, year. So I, I think does that's Does BSNA something. offer a certification? No, they do offer as just jumping down and not trying to jump ahead, but mm -hmm. it says request a training video. They do offer that training video. It's inside our BSNA system. You, you go up to the, the, the top and you can you know go down and you find they have the videos on how to use BSNA and how to work BSNA. Um, along with it says here that the public uh, could use. On the public portal, they also have, it's not a video, but it's a um, it's a step by step. It's like a PowerPoint that people can look at and 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 actually view on how to use the BSNA system. So the number six is already available for the council yes, and sir. the public. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it's but we don't have access to it. You're yes, going to make access to no, it. No, no, you have access to it. Fantastic. Okay. Great. I would. I think we we can scratch that one off. Just. Just teach us how to find it. It's, um, uh, and the, the public has available. Yes, on the to public it? website. This is the front of the website of the public yep. website. And there is, a, as soon as you bring up the public web, website, before you can put in an address or anything, there's a bunch of links right here. It takes you to the PowerPoints to show you how to use BSNA. On the, okay. And, and my thought was that maybe we had some customizations and things. So I'll start there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, M Mayor, back up to number three. I would just, I think what we're saying is just scratch the last two words and BSNA because there is no certification or continuing education for BSNA. 
Well, I thought there's, internally you were going to. Yes, but there's no certification. Oh, I can't well, I create a certification. Right. I can create training right. for yeah. BSNA, but I can't create a certification. I gotcha. okay. And that will be in, in number two response anyways. So if we could just agree that we're taking and BSNA off of number three. Are we okay with that council? That way, yes. Yeah, okay. So then what's left is provide listed certifications and then that get, that's uh, face certifications and continue education for all code enforcement officers. That we can do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Number four, distribute a monthly BSNA report of all open code enforcement cases from initiation to close to include other important data provided by BSNA, such as date created, status, next step, or any other information necessary to monitor. Yes, sir. The, um, the only thing with that is it says all open code enforcement cases from initiation to closed. If it's open, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have a closed in it. It, it would just be, um, I can generate a report of all code enforcement cases. I can do that right now. That, that's, a, that's one of our things that we have opportunity or that we have available to us. Um, I, 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 will, I can look at what data I can put in that spreadsheet. Uh, um, that's, uh, I, I don't necessarily know everything. I know it has a lot. I can put a lot of data in there. Um, and I have done these reports in the past. It won't have a closed date because it's still open, of course. Understood. I um, think where you, you know where we are, whatever version you come up with I think is a good starting point. Let me understand the request just a little bit better, though. So we want to, we're talking about a, a report, a monthly report of open code enforcement cases, including their status, date created, next step, and any other information. Is that something that we can readily do with BSNA? Yes. I'll, yeah, I'll look for the, the fields because it says date created. I know it does status because that would be open and I, I don't know about next step, but I can look at that. I do know I can create a report of all open code enforcement cases, but when you create these reports, I technically have to build them. I have to build the spreadsheet. So I have to go in and actually select the different things to put in the spreadsheet that you're requesting. But you only so have to build it once though, I right? Yes, only have to build it once, but I don't want to say yes, I can, give you, yes, it's going to tell you what the next step is. Gotcha. I don't want to say yes, because if I, then I go into BSNA and I go, oh, there's no option for next step to put on that form. Could, could we get it in two reports, breaking it up, having one that are um, ones that we've closed and the other are any open? The closed one would probably be extremely long. Or that year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if oh, we okay. go back to the, yeah, if we, if we we'll limit it to the fiscal yes. year or the calendar year, I think that would be very doable. I think it'd be good for comparison's sake. Brian, any comments on that? Um, I, I believe I can. Um, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'll try my hardest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to understand that will be a work in progress, much like the financial reports were. Yes, and I think that any other, any, I know Council Member Willis has a profession and knowledge and experience in software, and uh, Brian, very happy from our meetings and the stuff, you jump right on things and, and understand. I think you got a very good sense of what we want. Is it, what is a valuable code enforcement report? Because today, we, it's, it's viewable on an individual. We can't just from a council view say, here, here are the issues. Um, and so, you know, if we could do that, we could go in and view, we can go back as far as we want, but we can't, and we wouldn't have to export or print those reports, but that's where I hope that we can get. Okay, we're good with that. We can move on number five. It says, review and distribute comprehensive report from BSNA regarding the city's engagement with the properties located at these addresses for the past five years and present. I'd like to suggest that we take out everything before the word present because all that moved that's, up into number one. That's fine. So number five just becomes yeah. present any findings and our opportunities to be distributed to the city council in ways the city can improve our community development department as it relates to code enforcement. As long as number one absorbs those yeah. addresses. Yes, yeah. And, okay. and the five years. Yep, okay. Yep. 
So that's what we'll call number five. Um, Brian, Dave, any comments with that? I don't, I don't see any issues with that. And number six is request a training video. To, we already discussed that one, so that's already available. So um, as amended, Mayor, if there's consensus on the council, we'd be happy to, to perform all of that. Thank you very much, council. I think we have consensus. No formal vote needed, city attorney, on anything? All opposed? Any opposed? No? Okay. Consensus is recorded. Thank you very much. We, I know that this is right in the middle of a work day for, for everyone, and um, I don't have anything else. We can adjourn if that's... We can get to bed on time. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Council, I have, and I had no intentions of, uh, thank you for, for speaking up, absolutely, please come forward, and um, it's, I might have to leave as soon as, yeah, and I certainly, I she's finished, no, thank you. six of 2017 because there's still an open violation at 120 and 118 Jackson Avenue that has not been um, addressed as far as sewage and things like that so I appreciate you going back five years but I really even if it's nothing more than just to review those documentations of the revised or of the notice of violation that go back yes to your point Mr. Willis a notice of violation was issued it was issued 11 one of 2023, 16 months after the original uh, complaint, after the original pictures were done. So yes, I don't want any, there to be any uh, misconstruing. Also, I would like for the council to take a look at any uh, other code enforcement issues, not just with me that would be, con that are at least optically retaliation because I find it striking to me that I once bring up a complaint then get a notice of violation and then I bring up a complaint and then I get another notice of violation I also would like to state for the record that on 929 Brian Palmer emailed Todd Morley and said there has not been any courtesy letters because all violations Compliance was gained in the field. So 10, 27, Dave Dickey comes and walks the property and says, this is a nightmare. This is a life safety issue and it needs immediate action. So the action has been taken and I applaud these guys for moving forward, but it nearly cost my business three times. And the fact that I now pay an insurance premium that's elevated by about three times because since the time of this fire and the times that I have asked for a notice of violation to be done, I have had one insurance inspector come out and cancel the insurance. And I now had another insurance inspector come out that says, yes, we will do it, but your cost will be approximately three times and it will be three times times the next 25 years which is how long I currently own the lease for in the building. All of this, I'm sure, will come into play, but don't just look at this, because the entire time that I have been fighting the city on this, two things are in my mind. Number one, is this retaliation? And number two, would I have been taken seriously if it were my husband here asking for help and not me? So is it retaliation or is it discrimination? Or is it just selective enforcement? And those are the answers I would like to know. Thank you, Ms. Schaller. I think that um, this is this is these being able to get this in into the council. We haven't had these capabilities and views to see and understand on an individual case basis and across many cases. And uh, continuing to understand where we are and in, in both of those respects and communicating with you and any other property owners on that list 
with the help of city staff leading those improvements, I think we're gonna to be able to understand your questions and concerns, so thank you. Okay, council, any other comments? Or anyone else who would like to speak? Anyone online? I see no hands raised, if so, go ahead. Meeting adjourned.